Buenos días a todos, bienvenidos al Ayuntamiento de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles y al Consejo Municipal de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles. Hoy es martes 13 de mayo de 2003. El Consejo Municipal se reúne todos los martes, miércoles y viernes a las 10 de la mañana. El, el público es invitado a presenciar esta reunión para los que no pueden ir en persona. Pueden ver nuestra vez el canal 35, canal cable o también a través de la página de internet de la ciudad vía telefónica actuario o tome lista Padilla, Bernstein, Garcetti, Gruel, LaBanche, Misikowski, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Wise, Sign 11 miembros presentes en quórum completo señor presidente, muchas gracias antes de iniciar este asunto el día de hoy, ya que es martes, primer día de la semana tenemos en el horario nos salud a la bandera, señora Perry por favor, pónganse de pie Place your uh, right hand over your heart and begin. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic, republic for, for which it stands, one, one nation under God, with indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, first order of business, please. Muchas gracias. Of the minutes. Mr. Zion moves. Mr. LeBarge seconds. Resoluciones for approval. Moves, Convocatorias se van a aprobar. La agenda de reuniones presenta asunto 9. Es una confirmación de un oficial de la ciudad, John Boyajian. Se llevó a cabo audiencia pública en el comité. Asunto 9. Ahora está pendiente. Tenemos un reporte del comité recomendando aprobación. Otro miembro que se hace presentación sobre el asunto número 9. Ni uno. Actuario, abra ese voto para esta confirmación. Cierra ese voto y tabule ese conteo. 11, sí. Señor Boyajian. Señor Boyajian, ha sido confirmado en felicitaciones. Gracias por su servicio a la ciudad. Next slide. La agenda regular asunto 1 a 5 son asuntos para audiencias públicas, confirmación de las sesiones para seguridad, para el edificio de seguridad. Asunto 5, tengo tarjeta de parte del público del, del resto del 1 al 4, no tengo petición para presentación del público, por lo tanto la audiencia se abre y se cierra. 1 al 4. ¿Alguien desea que te algo especial? Ni uno, actuario, abra ese voto, cierre ese voto y tabule ese conteo. 11, sí, han sido aprobados. Asunto número 6 también es la audiencia pública. Consigo de reunirse la audiencia y coordinar esta audiencia para ordenanza para el 3 de junio. Asunto número 6 es pendiente y no tengo tarjeta de parte del público para comentar el público. Por tanto, la audiencia se abre y sin oposición será aplazado este asunto hasta el 3 de junio. Procedemos. Item number seven is a public a hearing item. Continue the consideration of a planning land use management committee report. Pública. No tengo presiones del público para hablar con el Consejo Municipal sobre el número 7. Señora Gruel, distribuyo una moción, una enmienda que distribuimos esta mañana y eso nos permitirá agrandar estas horas aplazadas, una hora más. Motion, which I think may be handed out. Yes, and Hal Burns and second the motion. Okay, members, a Algún, amending motion una moción, is una enmienda ha sido distribuida. Si no hay diálogo adicional o repaso adicional sin protesta, entonces consideramos asunto número 7 con ese cambio. Actuario, abra ese voto. Si ese voto y tabule ese conteo. 12, 6. Esto ha sido aprobado. Procedemos. Item number 8 is a second reading ordinance and it's regarding health and welfare program for retired employees. Temples are required. Los lados que han sido jubilados, asunto 8 está pendiente y no tengo petición del público para comentar el público sobre este asunto. Por lo tanto, la audiencia se abre y se cierra. ¿Alguien necesita hacer comentarios sobre asunto 8? Ni uno, actuario, abra ese voto. Cierre ese voto y tabule ese conteo. 13, sí. Asunto 8 ha sido aprobado. Procedamos. 10 a 21 son audiencias que han tenido asuntos que han tenido audiencia pública. 10 al 21. 
Yes, I want to make a, a motion to reconsider. No, me siempre habría considerado el asunto 12 e del 9 de mayo. Voy a tomar una moción suplente, asunto 12 e. Pido por la señora Perry. Abra ese voto para reconsiderar ese asunto. Se ese voto y tabule ese conteo. 13, sí. Reconsiderado, señora Perry. Hizo un error, ese es el asunto equivocado. Let's hold that matter on the desk and proceed to uh, Procedamos the matters on today's al, agenda. Items 10 to 21, currently before us, request for any specials, 10 to 21 of today's agenda. Mr. Mr. Parks, 17 and 18, 18, 18, 18. call special by Mr. Parks, as well as item number 10, Mr. Holden. Uh, then I'll have uh, 14 and 21. 14 and 21. 10 and 17 special. Thank you. 14 and 21, call special by Mr. Holden. Special por el señor Holden. Any other specials? Algún otro? Any other specials? Algún otro? Items 10 through 21 Asuntos now before 10 us. 21 no están pendientes. Asuntos 10, 14, 17, 18 y 21 no han sido autorizados. Como especial, el resto de los asuntos actuaría. Abra ese voto, cierre ese voto y tabula ese conteo. 13, 6, esos han sido aprobados. Procedamos. Asuntos que no han tenido audiencias públicas, asunto 22 a 42. Tengo tarjetas de parte del público en 32 y 39. Los miembros se han actualizado esto como especial. Señor Lavage, señor Holden. 21 y 25. 25 y 27. Call special by Mr. Holden. 27. Call special by Mr. Holden. Ms. Gruel. I was going to ask something to go forthwith, so when we're ready. Mr. Pacheco. Señor Pacheco. 34. Call special by Mr. Pacheco. Señor Pacheco. Any other specials? Mr. Reyes. Yes, 29 F. Es un cambio técnico. Has that amendment been circulated? Yes. Yes, it is the Okay, unless there's an objection, we'll continue. 29F as amended. Any other specials? No Seeing none, the no. balance of the items that have been approved is open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 eyes. Those items are approved, including 29F as amended. Any other specials? Four with on 33, please. Four with on 33. Any other specials? Mr. Lavage is in the room. Fourth with on 28, please. 28 también que se ha enviado al alcalde. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Going back to the items called special. Item number five was called special. As much as there are cards from the public. Mr. Before going to item number five, Mr. Reyes, I request for one of the agenda items to be moved to the desk. Please do so. Number five, please. 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 Uh, we do have the school board member with us. Tenemos I believe he's here. De la junta directiva presente. And I was hoping we can bring that up front so that I can show some courtesy and uh, me gustaría Remember, we have a request to take item 39 out of order. Is there any objection to that? Seeing no objection, we'll take item 39 first. Mr. Reyes, did you wish to speak before going to public comment, or should we go direct to speaker cards? Thank you, Council President. Colleagues, before us, Tenemos una moción, una resolución que este, este Consejo Municipal ha apoyado vez tras vez porque este Consejo Municipal ha notado la necesidad de tratar con una necesidad bastante crítica para los jóvenes y las familias en el área de Belmont y el, la construcción de una escuela. Estamos pidiendo, por lo tanto, y le pido su apoyo to the school board that a 20-year promise needs to be fulfilled that the conditions are the model for our 
de que las condiciones de esa comunidad están empeorando. La necesidad de proveer escuelas con 36, 26 asientos es en esa área, esa área es un área muy, muy pobre. Con esta resolución podemos mandar un mensaje claro a los miembros de la Junta Directiva Escolar y en nombre de los Espíritu, en nombre de nuestros jóvenes, familias, nuestros niños, estamos tomando la situación a todos en la ciudad. Construir una escuela aquí de nuevo llenará este vacío. Las condiciones están en un momento muy, muy deteriorado. Los niños están siendo transportados a otra escuela. No podemos esperar más. Apoyando esta solución, la escuela será construida dentro de los siguientes tres años. Nos permitirá mejorar una calidad de vida que se necesitaría por mucho tiempo y nos pondremos en una posición para una mejor negociación. Esto es un inicio. También llegamos a un punto de hay que demostrar que si valoramos las vidas de nuestros niños, deseamos crear una solución para transportación a través de autobuses y queremos proveer a nuestra familia la misma calidad de vida que cualquier otra familia desea. En el resto de la ciudad, por lo tanto, con esto pido un voto unánime en esta resolución que doy las gracias a miembro de la Junta Directiva José Huizar del Distrito. Quiero compartir con ustedes que el otro día tuvimos un evento histórico. Tuvimos la supervisora Gloria Molina, senador Cedillo, asambleísta Jackie Gopher, representante con Congresista Bayal Roy, Bayal de Fireball, Fabián, todos de acuerdo sobre lo mismo, al mismo tiempo apoyando la construcción de una escuela en el lugar de Belmont. Hemos esperado mucho tiempo, ya no debemos de jugar fútbol político sobre este asunto. El alcalde Han lo ha apoyado, ha escrito una declaración previa. Creo que estamos todos juntos, por favor, hay que demostrar una presencia unificada. Gracias, señor Reyes. Ahora, cards, uh, Council calls for school board member Jose Wizard, to be followed by Stephanie Landrigan, Stephanie Landrigan Joe Edmonston, Joe Edmonston Mia Lehrer, and Mia Lehrer Glenn y Glenn Gritzer. Good morning, Council buenos días, President. Good morning, Council eh, members. Buenos días. Como se va, primero, quiero dar las gracias al liderazgo del concejal Reyes por presentar este asunto nuevo como prioridad y así proveer y presentar al Distrito Escolar de Los Ángeles a la Conservatorio de Santa Mónica y pedimos llevar a cabo este plan. Estuvimos aquí hace un año, pedimos un apoyo un año para completar la escuela de Belmont entonces el Consejo Municipal reconoce la necesidad de construir esa preparatoria y dejar de transportarse en un estado de sobre esto ya por mucho tiempo y después de ese tiempo parece que nos olvidamos de los efectos reales que afectan a los niños los problemas que ocurren por esta transportación y también los problemas el problema también que Is so severely overcrowded. We all Creo un horario the of the a través de todo, todo el año y esperen siete días. Hoy, esta semana, el Distrito Escolar tiene la oportunidad de finalmente finalizar este asunto y así proceder. Como ustedes saben, el Distrito decidió el año pasado proceder y completar el proyecto. Desafortunadamente, abajo dentro de la tierra y por lo tanto paramos porque queríamos asegurar de que íbamos a construir una preparatoria en un lugar muy seguro para los autónomos. Sin embargo, hay tres opciones. Tres opciones. Una es de construir 360 asientos en ese lugar. Esta opción hará que niños ya no tengan que ser transportados. La opción dos será proveer 160 asientos en la parte oeste. En tres años, en este lugar, tendremos que esperar 
que es 1100 años se han completado en seis años. Para mí esto no es aceptable. Yo no puedo continuar a ubicar 1100 estudiantes en otros institutos de esta, esta comunidad. Necesito una escuela, necesita ahora estoy aquí para pedirles que apoyen opción 1, la cual no solamente proveerá los asientos para los alumnos, pero también proveerá necesidad para esta comunidad, para la comunidad del centro de Los Ángeles. Se abrió también espacio de un parque y proveerá esta comunidad. Espacio recreacional que es muy necesario también proveerá una clase, un aula sin paredes para la escuela anexa. Si esto se verá claro, también pido que apoyen a la escuela, al instituto escolar. Esperamos que el Consejo Municipal de nuevo mencione su apoyo para los niños en esta comunidad y terminar este. Asociación de Acuerdos Encontrables, concejal Reyes, ha mencionado que hay varios uh, oficiales elegidos que apoyan opción 1, también incluye padres y estudiantes de la comunidad y también incluye MALDEF y otras organizaciones. Espero que ustedes apoyen esta resolución. Muchas gracias. Gracias, señor Rizar. Stephanie Landrigan. Stephanie Landrigan. Good morning, council members, Buenos Mr. Días. President. Uh, I'm the chief landscape architect for the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. I have here uh, the plan that we have proposed, which we consider the best option, uh, an opportunity to take the existing Belmont School and to add an element la escuela Belmont actual y agregar un elemento de educación que es único a la ciudad. Esto será un laboratorio y unas aulas adicionales. Lo que hemos hecho en estos parques, construimos áreas de entrada del área urbana, el cual era un sentimiento como que está entrando a un lugar muy sagrado. Este lugar aquí, ustedes vendrían de la calle Houghton, que es el punto más elevado de esta montaña donde se ubica en un parque y entrarán a un lugar, una área donde se incluirá el ladrillo de Belmont, el cual ha sido nombrado históricamente después basado en la preparatoria de Belmont. Estos serán incluidos para construir los elementos que tendrán pasos de entrada que serán muy formal y después entrarán al elemento natural. Me gustaría también indicar que tenemos an image of a una watershed. So we have taken a watershed element and we've applied it to agua, a park. And we will have actual watershed element in retention, de sustainable de design. De agua. And we also plan to have a fishing pond, an urban fishing pond, which, uh, as we all know, is not something that you can commonly do in uh, Los Angeles. Eso no uh, se ve after we will be Mia Lear, who is also the landscape architect who helped me design this, she'll show you some of the photographs that she has named it Vista Hermosa, which is, by the way, truly an appropriate name for this site. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Es muy difícil creer esto, pero hard to believe, but this classroom without walls, which is actually part of the 14 acres, which are part of the Belmont site, were incorporated the soccer field that was originally being proposed for the site. We're not taking away any of the programmed activities, but it becomes this incredible joint use opportunity in terms of park and school. And you can see here, we're looking at downtown, the upper plateau, where we're creating a pond, the fishing pond, Estamos construyendo el lago con los pescados. Esa es una vista que hace una semana y dibujamos este dibujo para darles una idea de cómo podrá verse en el futuro. Una de estas partes del parque también incluirá un pequeño teatro donde uno puede incluir 
temas como biología, química, pero también pueden tener lecturas de poesía y otros estudios académicos se pueden llevar en este teatro afuera en el sur de California. Tenemos la oportunidad de tomar ventaja del el tiempo. En nuestro ambiente tenemos hace yo, cuando fui a la comunidad, a la reunión de la comunidad la semana pasada, no conocimos cuántos de la gran pasión que sienten los miembros de la comunidad sobre Belmont y ellos dan a mí esta idea y este será no solamente un lugar donde podrían ir durante la semana, pero los fines de semana y por las tardes pueden también montar ventaja de este parque. Joe Edmiston from the Santa Monica Edmiston. Mountains Conservancy is uh, parking and we were hoping he would arrive on time, but um, no llegado, pero this, uh, the budget for this uh, park will come out este of Prop 40 and Prop 50 funds. Uh, this would not cost Será the district any money. And uh, we just uh, hope you can all come forward to support uh, the project, uh, which we have. Uh, we think it's a wonderful addition to the community and downtown. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe Edmiston is in the building. Edmiston. We'll give yeah. him a few more minutes to arrive. Glenn Gritzner, Glenn Gritzner. followed by Sharif Asadula. Good morning, Council Members, Glenn Gritzner, the Superintendent's Office at LAUSD. I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about where the superintendent has been on this issue and where we are today. Um, I just, a little bit of history very quickly. When the superintendent came into office, Belmont was shut down. No construction was happening, and it was essentially um, not happening. When the superintendent came, he said, el I'm committed to this community. I'm committed to meeting this need. Esta posición, dijo, and estoy comprometido a esta comunidad y para mejorar esta necesidad de como resultado, Renovo y Belmont, al modo de actuar si ustedes deciden construir o no construirlo, estamos teniendo un diálogo ahora de cómo construirlo. Es un gran cambio político, es un cambio para mejorar esta comunidad. También es muy importante recordar que hay 3.300 asientos para la escuela preparatoria para construcción dentro de So this need is being met today, and the schools will be able to be built within the next two, two three years. As you know, all three options do provide the 2,600 seats. There are issues of design and construction costs and time. The superintendent originally had a recommended option for a variety of reasons, but opposed to any of the other options. He never felt that for some reasons to build the next two, three years. However, as a note for the people who came into the timing of the election, many more people were involved in the asientos de 1,100 asientos. We have reduced our options to make it as possible. We want to improve the asiento as much as possible. We also want to investigate the use of the existing buildings, although we have to remove two buildings where the fall is. The superintendent of the park is beautiful. It will be a great addition to the site. There are a variety of ways to park. It will be important to the site. Este lugar y esto beneficiará muchísimo a la comunidad y lo estamos trabajando precisamente para resolver los asuntos uh, tocantes. Solamente quería reiterar el hecho que estamos trabajando para proveer, proveer la mejor alternativa y las, los 2.600 asientos lo más posible sin comprometer el ambiente académico y también estamos considerando cómo mejorar los edificios para uso académico. If Sharif is not with us, Joe Edmiston, have you arrived? Joe Edmiston. Joe going once, Joe going twice. We'll have to conclude public comment at this time. I'm returning now to council discussion. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Mr. Reyes and Mr. Wizar, for your leadership and continued leadership on this issue. While uh, this proposed site would not be in District 13, certainly a lot of the students who will go there, and I do say will, not would, uh, will be from my district. And I think it's wonderful to see uh, folks who are looking at expanding urban fishing, uh, which you can do in Echo Park, by the way. 
Um, and we're looking at putting a green uh, heart to the, the city on the western edge when we look at what's happening jardines, throughout the city from Chinatown Yards to there este and we look at downtown really being ringed veces. by some of the most glorious urban parks that teach about Miramos nature as close to the founding parques. of the city as possible. It really is a transformative um, possibility and one that I very strongly support. To those who are wavering uh, maybe in the school district no or the board, no between muy... which option Seguros en cuanto a las opciones, el argumento se, se ha presentado muchas veces, mientras tenemos más asientos bajo construcción en esa área, pero si consideran la proyección del futuro, lo que podemos decir es de que menos niños serán transportados de esa área. Y sabiendo la cantidad de niños que se levantan y tienen que ser transportados a través de autobús fuera de su comunidad para su buena educación, me pregunto yo cuántos niños podemos, cuántos niños permitiremos que sean transportados fuera de la escuela y es la cantidad de ser ser nosotros como sociedad debemos de proveer una escuela y un parque para esos niños para que si caminen a esos lugares son derechos básicos para niños no tenemos que ser muy inteligentes para apoyar esto yo sé que ha habido un historial con este lugar pero hemos visto luz al fin del túnel pero también habrá espacio verde o jardines y también espacio educacional gracias por su apoyo gracias señor Reyes por su gran liderazgo señor Luisa gracias alcalde gracias por su apoyo esto ha sido un grupo muy histórico hemos tenido muchos obstáculos en el camino pero es algo que en el futuro miraremos y Estoy muy orgulloso por haber apoyado esto. Gracias, señor Hogan. La razón por la cual esta escuela no fue aprobada al principio fue por la contaminación en la tierra. ¿Es así? ¿Ya? ¿Ya mejoraron esto? Lo que tenemos es DTS, el Departamento de que trata con tóxicos ha estado trabajando con el superintendente Romer, ha hecho un gran trabajo agrupando a todos los expertos para resolver sus asuntos tal como han resultado en todos los años. Mi pregunta es la contaminación de tierra o de tóxico el cual fue identificado en esa área ya ha desaparecido o no ha desaparecido pero tenemos un sistema de mitigación que puede empezar y para hacerlo sobre tenemos aquí este señor para problemas daños ambientales él puede contestar buenos días mi nombre es Dave Jensen soy subdirector mi nombre es Dave Jensen, soy subdirector de la Oficina de Daño Ambiental y Seguridad para el Ambiente. Como mencionado, este lugar ha sido considerado seriamente. Los contaminantes que fueron identificados previamente aún están ahí. Ya sabemos que están ahí. Es una condición de diferentes químicas y básicamente a través de esta investigación hemos determinado cuál, qué cantidad es y dónde está ubicado y así podemos crear condiciones ambientales para mejorar todos lo que conocemos sobre todas estas químicas y estamos encontrando soluciones para mejorar esto. Primero, la razón por la que se construye es por la falla del que se encuentra bajo la escuela. La opción es derrumbar los edificios que están sobre esta falla. Esto mejora las cosas en ese lugar. Para hacer los edificios van a ser excluidos. No hay peligro en cuanto al temblor y ya estamos en una buena posición ahora. Por ley estatal no podemos construir una escuela dentro de 50 pies de una falla activa. La falla que tenemos aquí no podemos decir si es activa o no es activa. Estamos siendo muy precavidos, estamos construyendo dentro de 50 pies de esa falla, pero tenemos que derrumbar dos edificios que actualmente están en esa falla. No tenemos esos edificios y derrumbaremos esos edificios. Yo voy a apoyarlo, señor Reyes, pero voy a predecir algo que no se construirá una escuela ahí. Si se construye, no se abrirá. Y la razón por la que no se abrirá y se construye, y lo he dicho antes, porque si quieren una preparatoria ahí para 
than it would have been done a long time ago. The arguments that were used over the years is the reason why they couldn't open up the school because of the toxins, the toxicity, 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 the
un campo para béisbol, tal como está en Toluca Lake o en el Instituto. Por lo tanto, quiero mencionar esto para se considera sino aquí en el Legion, el grupo de voy a tratar de construir las clases, las aulas para la preparatoria Belmont. Y terminaré diciendo como graduado de la preparatoria de Marshall, me pongo de pie para apoyar al preparador de Belmont, que es un rival de nuestra preparatoria, pero lo apoyaré. Gracias, señor Bernstein. Yes, members of the council, there's no question about the need uh, that the uh, children have for this uh, school in the downtown area. It's been a long past due. There have been a lot of mistakes made, but we have to go forward. And I think that's where my colleague, Mr. Reyes, is coming from. Esa es la posición de mi colega Reyes. Hay ciertas preguntas, obviamente, tenemos fallos de temblores, hay ciertas cosas que tenemos que hacer. 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 En esta ciudad, abajo de este, del ayuntamiento aquí, y hace poco han dicho que quizás puede ocurrir un cambio de 7.5 en el centro de pero eso significa que debemos dejar de vivir. Aparentemente, cada 200 o 300 años ocurre un temblor. También no sabemos cuándo ocurre un temblor. Pero los edificios pueden construirse el día de hoy. Las normas que podrán sobrevivir un temblor, por ejemplo, cuando Reconstruyeron el ayuntamiento de los seis, hicieron una base, una fundación que aparentemente nos protegerá, protegerá supuestamente de un temblor en el futuro. Por lo tanto, yo apoyaré esta moción y les quiero pedir que el Distrito Escolar de Los Ángeles sean precavidos para desarrollar los planes de ingeniería para que van a estar lo más seguro posible bajo las condiciones actuales. Gracias, señor Reyes. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues, and I see we have our Mr. Jordanson arrived, Mr. President, on this matter. I just want to acknowledge the hard work of Councilor Reyes, and every time I travel down the 110 freeway, I see that vacant structure boarded up, collecting weeds and eyesore in the community. And I support your mission to improve the quality of life in your neighborhood and to improve education for the students. So you have my vote on this, and hopefully this will put an end to the controversy and do something positive with that abandoned structure that we have sitting adjacent to the 110 freeway. Colleagues, thank you so much for your support. I do want to take a minute to thank Quiero Superintendent Romer and his staff. They've been very proactive in working on joint ventures, mixed use, shared use. We're working on ordinances, uh, not only at the city level, but working with our state officials, the state levels. They've been very proactive. Uh, I just want to thank them for their hard work. Uh, but again, trabajo tan we diligente, pero luego tenemos ahora una oportunidad para mejorar esto, ya no jugar con las vidas de nuestros niños. Hay que enviar un mensaje bastante fuerte y esperamos que la Junta Directiva Escolar se une con el espíritu de las, para las generaciones futuro como una ciudad y considera una noción de que lo que es mejor para un niño en una parte de la ciudad debe ser igualmente bueno para otro niño en otra parte de la ciudad. Muchas gracias por su apoyo. I just couldn't resist the opportunity to do what so many of you do and talk about who I used to work for. So I wanted to say, first of all, Ed, that I think this is a wonderful solution. I will do whatever you want to support it. But I used to work as a consultant for Joe Edmonston and the Conservancy. And one of the things that I was doing was we were doing then, and obviously they have continued to do, is find ways to make multiple uses work. 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 Multiuso, así que eso se funciona. No sé cuánto recuerdan que el Museo Getty se construyó a través de diferentes compromisos y negociaciones con UCLA y el grupo de para conservar las montañas. Pero lo que es muy atractivo sobre esto es los tipos de experiencia que 
El grupo de conservatorio puede traer a la, al diálogo de, para uso múltiple es algo sumamente importante y lo necesitamos felicitaciones. Yo solamente quería mencionar que yo trabajaba para este asunto. Muchas gracias, señor Canatra. Muchas gracias por hacer presentación sobre este asunto. Nino, actuario, abre ese voto. Cierre ese voto y tabule ese conteo. 15, sí. Ha sido aprobado. Next item, Mr. President, item number five was called special for cards from the public, and I understand that Councilmember Perry wishes to continue that matter for one week to May 20th. Asunto cinco este asunto por una semana okay. hasta el 20 de mayo. Members request to continue item number five to May 20th without objection. Para aplazar asuntos cinco sin protestas se llevará a cabo. Next item, please. Procedamos. Um, item number asunto ten was called special by Councilmember Parks. Asunto número diez que procede especial por el Parks. Mr. Parks. Señor Parks. Item number ten. Asunto diez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just, uh, first of all, on make a verbal amendment to the motion in the report uh, that I think will clarify a couple of uh, long practices regarding varios puntos tocante a los asuntos del Estadio, que esta propuesta no aumentará impuestos actuales ni creará impuestos adicionales y pondrá tampoco a la cuenta del Fondo General en riesgo. Pero es importante, mientras consideramos las dinámicas y cómo estas se relacionan a Pro Fútbol en la ciudad de Los Ángeles o en esta región, debemos presentar una moción para activar o llevar a cabo una audiencia por el Comité Temporario del Estadio. Durante esta reunión del Comité, varias personas dieron testimonio en cuanto a los beneficios económicos para la ciudad de Los Ángeles, la región regional en cuanto al desarrollo económico, pero más importantemente está hablando acerca del desarrollo del Coliseo, la elección, selección del Coliseo como un lugar ideal y después de considerar toda la ciudad de Los Ángeles y en áreas con desarrollo económico, el CRA decidió que el Coliseo tiene las más ventajas para la ciudad solamente en cuanto al tiempo para que este sea reparado y y actualizado y mejorado, pero considerando el menos impacto en las áreas alrededores, en particular reconociendo los varios millones de dólares que han sido ya gastados en el Coliseo, parte del Parque Exposición, ya con este reporte extenso y también con la información, además que ha sido presentado por el CRA y también información que se presentó del Comité de Deportes y Comercios. Es sumamente claro que mientras procedemos, escuchamos y consideramos todos los reportes sobre la posibilidad de tener un fútbol en el Parque Oeste, la ciudad de Los Ángeles perderá, si no posicionamos una propuesta que al menos el Consejo Municipal puede apoyar y después puede ser utilizado para la Comisión de Coliseo. Esperamos que estos tres niveles de gobierno pueden llegar a una solución para así poder al menos iniciar esta práctica y tener eh, un equipo de fútbol como dialogamos en el comité es que no, no vamos a poder tener un diálogo de fútbol si no tenemos una posición de apoyo de el Partido Comisión Municipal y también el Comité del Comisión por tanto con este cambio que acabé de ofrecer en cuanto a los impuestos que siempre es una preocupación de parte de muchos del, del público y de miembros de este Comisión Municipal espero apoyar el aporte del Comité esa es una adhesión por el presidente de la Junta también el grupo de propuesta ha sido activado para que si ellos puedan repasar cualquier propuesta que se presentara en sociedad y así de un reporte regreso al Consejo Municipal el cuando será la habilidad de mantenernos al tanto de todas las negociaciones mientras procedemos por lo tanto yo Quiero recomendar un voto sí sobre esta propuesta para así tener la habilidad de proceder con esto hacia la comisión del colegio y así informar la posición de el consejo municipal. Señor presidente, creo que yo sé que muchos de ustedes han tomado un interés en fútbol y estados de fútbol y 
Hemos fijado un límite aquí en Los Ángeles que no vamos a pagar para que el NFL venga a Los Ángeles. Quiero reiterar este punto, vez tras vez, tras vez, que la ciudad de Los Ángeles no va a utilizar fondos de los que pagan impuestos y así dárselos a la NFL para traer una franquicia de esta ciudad. Sin embargo, no tengo que decirles que mientras consideramos Fútbol, yo he sido un gran activista de un lugar en la parte este de Los Ángeles, cerca del centro de Los Ángeles. Lo que quiero hacer es afortunado que el comité no pudo mirar esto. Lo tengo. Un estadio anexo al río teniendo una situación similar, tal como lo tienen en el tazón de rosas. Tenemos un parque completo anexo al río y habrá un estadio, estará dentro, muy cercano al MTA, estación de transportación, y hay una manera para que este sea adecuado para peatones del MTA al estado y esto presentará varias ideas. Ideas uno, un nuevo estadio de fútbol, un estadio al lado del río, construir cerca alrededor del río un parque y también podemos incluir, ir más allá si tenemos la exposición de política de un tratamiento de agua del MTLL. Hay muchas posibilidades aquí. Esto está dentro del proyecto de desarrollo de adelante. Tiene un impacto, con, un impacto mínimo en cuanto a asuntos de policías, pero tengo que ponerme de pie. Parte de mi distrito, el río, parte de este respeto al reporte del comité, pero al mismo tiempo quiero decirles que también hay otras opciones que quizás el NFL pueda considerar, pero yo te quería presentar esto para... Su consideración, gracias, señor Weiss. Gracias, señor presidente. Yo quiero reconocer los esfuerzos extraordinarios en este poco tiempo que el señor Parks está en el Consejo Municipal trabajando con este asunto. Usted tiene una gran posición que lograr en cuanto al asunto de fútbol. Son cuatro. Sí, los zapatos del señor Labange. Y también los zapatos del señor Ridley Thomas también. No voy a hablar más sobre eso. Yo soy muy fanático del fútbol. Yo apoyo la idea de tener un fútbol en la de Los Ángeles. Yo no apoyo esta forma. Yo voté en contra de crear el comité temporario hace varios meses. Y en punto de vista, es una manera de negociar con 37 algo de hombres que son billonarios, los dueños de los grupos de NFL. ¿Por qué? Y una mujer, sí, 36 y algo hombres y una mujer. Porque ellos han mostrado muchas veces que su forma es de... Engañar a ciudades y no creo que la ciudad de Los Ángeles sea la siguiente víctima. El NFL necesita a Los Ángeles más de que Los Ángeles necesita la implementación. Tiene el concepto de tomar posición de esta visión. En mi punto de vista, la responsabilidad de vencer en el NFL de mostrar a Los Ángeles porque es nuestra ventaja de incluirnos en esos diálogos hasta ese entonces hasta que me demuestren esto creo yo que enviamos la estrategia la señal de estratégica equivocada estar tan animados de llegar a algún trato con el NFL porque todas las pruebas que yo he visto en cuanto a cómo han tratado con otras ciudades y cómo han tratado en otras ciudades me hace sentir muy dudoso tomar esta estrategia y digo esto con siendo un gran fanático de fútbol. Señor Brinson, si yo obviamente apoyo que el fútbol sea reubicado en Los Ángeles y se hace de manera adecuada, y obviamente el Coliseo, el cual ya está en lugar, ha sido una institución en esta ciudad por muchísimo tiempo, desde que yo era niño, ese es un lugar obvio. The main thing is, I think, as Mr. Weiss has stated, there cannot be any 
even thought on the part of these owners as they negotiate no se a cabo uh, with the powers that be in the city to pay or subsidize bringing the team to the city. Uh, this or is a multi-million dollar es un operation. Uh, the owners are multi-millionaires that make large profits, que ganan both from the television rights and everything else. And this is a, probably the top de sports y otros area in the country, es and they need to be here. So uh, I will support it, particularly, particularly with your amendments, Mr. Parks, that, Parks, that we make it clear that no public money is being involved in bringing uh, the team to Los Angeles. Para traer a ese Ms. Equipo Los Angeles. Señora Calanter. You know, it, it seems to me that, uh, I, let me say, I am not particularly a football fan, no um, although I have enjoyed myself in football games, but I think that it is worth cosas, a lot to this city to at vale least be in talks with them. And I certainly uh, want to support the motion. Ellos. I would like to say that, that while I appreciate the, the primacy of the Coliseum, it seems to me the most important thing for us to do is to think about what it would take to have a team somewhere in the city of Los Angeles. So I would write off Los Los Angeles. 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 Uh, income that comes with a team come into the city of LA, not into one of our neighboring cities, but into our city, so we get the local share of the sales tax, and we get the dead tax and the hotels and all the rest of that stuff. So it does seem to me that we ought to be at the table, we ought to be talking to them, we don't have to tell them we're going to give them any money, but we ought to be in a position of describing to them the advantages to them of being in the city of Los Angeles, because part of their negotiating strategy is to pretend that there are and we know and they know that there are advantages to them being here. So I also want to support the motion, but I hope that as I'm reading the way it's stated on the agenda, that you would consider framing it in the context, first and foremost, of what it would take to bring the team to the city. And if they won't come without public money, well, then they won't come without public money, and that could be debated as it comes up, and I think we all know what the outcome would be. But at least see what we can get there, and if the city of Los Angeles or other villages are willing to consider one place in the city, but not another place in the city, we still want to come back and discuss that. We still want to come back and discuss that. I'm not sure exactly how this might be modified, but that is what we want to do. No sé exactamente cómo esto puede ser. Ser um, modificado, pero si sí, es entendido porque específicamente se van acerca de traer un equipo al coliseo, yo estoy. Me siento como de decir que eso es un primer objetivo, pero podemos cambiar esto de alguna manera para que indique que traer a un equipo para la ciudad de Los Ángeles con énfasis en el coliseo. La razón por la cual hicimos es que de esta manera es que se rea y se lo puede tener nueve áreas de desarrollamiento. Ellos concluyeron con tres, donde pensaron que era lo más adecuado después. De esos tres, escogieron uno, ¿no? Y estamos considerando áreas donde pensamos que iba a traer el beneficio más grande económico, la ciudad y el área donde que presentó el señor Pacheco fue parte de esta evaluación y fue considerado que iba a costar más y vamos a quitar más negocios para poder traer más terreno porque iba a tomar más estacionamiento. Me parece que esto no claro, no estoy oponiendo eso, pero creo yo que si nos sentamos en la mesa con ellos, y si es esto lo que hemos considerado, que empezó a ser por francamente, si ellos ven con sus no creo que esto ocurra rápido. Pues esta es la manera que podemos hacer que esto ocurra aquí, bajo sus condiciones, allá bajo sus condiciones. No creo que queremos excluir esto, inmediatamente queremos tener otro diálogo sobre esto. Bueno, 
If we lo que yo he entendido es que si enviamos a un negociador para hablar con ellos y no tenemos al menos nuestro propio entendimiento de lo que pensamos que la ciudad producirá, entonces ellos lo hablarán con nosotros y continuarán considerando un área fuera de la ciudad. Claro, no quiero interferir con este proceso, solamente quiero dejar suficiente flexibilidad y espacio para no decir que nos gusta el colegio por lo tanto iremos a otra parte. Eso es todo. Creo yo que es la flexibilidad. Las personas del coliseo, personas que han tenido diálogos que no vengan aquí, no tengo un dirigente que comenté que sí, vendrían. Pero creo que es un asunto de simplificar estas oportunidades porque sin esas oportunidades el NFL tiene una historia de causar uh, ciudades y comunidades que compitan en contra de los otros y esto aumentará el costo y el precio del equipo es por eso que estamos tratando de buscar una simplificación para este proceso gracias señor presidente San Diego tiene un equipo de fútbol Oakland tiene un equipo de fútbol en San Francisco y nosotros no y queremos tener uno I support Yo apoyo the, uh, proposal to bring NFL la propuesta de traer el NFL de regreso a Los Ángeles. Sé que el consejero Hal Holden ha trabajado también con el previo consejero Ridley Thomas. Es un proceso un mejoramiento económico para Los Ángeles y estaremos en el mapa nuevo. Se inició aquí el Super Bowl y otras actividades extraordinarias, dos olímpicas. Olimpiadas, olimpiadas en el Coliseo. Sé que personas se han acercado a mí acerca de construir un estado del Valle de San Fernando. No creo que el Valle de San Fernando esté listo para este Coliseo, pero compañeros de construcción se han acercado a mi precio. Yo sé que la tazón de Rosas quiere atraer el equipo de NFL. Esto ayudará a Pasadena. Quiero reducir el tamaño del estadio, el cual recibirá un apoyo de la comunidad, el cual será el tránsito. Por lo tanto, yo apoyo proceder sobre eso. Lo único que me preocupa es acerca del estado económico. Quiero que aseguremos prote y que protegeremos el, la cuenta de fondo general y asegurar que tengamos los billonarios, dueños de fútbol que utilicen sus dólares ya que recibirán los beneficios extraordinarios como resultado. Pero es una idea que si no hacemos algo, estaremos en un lugar que será excluido y Soccer será muy, muy, muy mucho importante. Carson, que vamos a ser un estadio de soccer. Muchas vemos que más jóvenes están interesándose en soccer. Fútbol será opción secundaria. Muchas tenemos a los Lakers, a los Clippers, a los Kings, a otras actividades y un nuevo salón de concierto de Disney. Hemos revitalizado la ciudad y me parece que si no hacemos algo, de repente tenemos otro lo que quiero asegurar es que protegemos esa cantidad de fondos que generales apoyo yo al señor y si debemos de enviar a personas durante esta decisión debemos algo que yo que pase tiene la hora para entender dos personas en la misma mesa para mejorar la región del sur de California gracias señor Ohan Gracias, señor presidente. Colegas, yo me pongo de pie para apoyar lo que está pendiente ahora. A mí me encanta el colegio. Yo siempre, siempre me encanta ir al colegio. Tengo las mejores memorias mientras yo crecí vivía en Crenshaw y Florence. Mi papá me llevaba a Florence a Hoover. Manejamos el colegio y Llevamos a muchos juegos ahí. Antes de que los Rams se fueron, fui a los juegos de Raiders. Yo sí me deseo cuando hablábamos de la franquicia. La colección no estaba... La negociación ya la habíamos excluido, que, ya que decíamos que ya estaba viejo y no estaba actualizado. Lo que NFL estaba buscando estaba buscando un estadio lujoso y no voy a estar en la corazón. La única razón que es considera en Los Ángeles tiene razón el NFL. Quizás necesita a Los Ángeles y quizás es una desilusión que Los Ángeles no tenga un juego. Y me gusta a mí el hecho que decir sí, muchos gusto hablamos con ustedes pero pensamos que el Coliseo es el lugar más adecuado 
para considerarse el lugar más económico, es más bajo costo es el estadio que podremos renovar. Yo sé que hay planes en todas partes de la ciudad para mejorar la colección, maneras de que este sea más atractivo. Creo que toda esta área, Exposition Park, el museo, es un lugar perfecto para atraer familias, mamás, papás, hijos, para España y todo este estructura. Este lugar me estás mirando el juego, pero me da mucho gusto que estás en el acuerdo que el Coliseo es un lugar que si sí tenemos un equipo, este es el lugar donde se lo creo que es un área en la ciudad que está mostrando Um, you know, we're doing, we're, the museums are spending a lot of money in their expansion programs. It's really a beautiful area. Es una área muy, and muy going to be nothing uh, more beautiful than going to a museum, which was you know, a the, uh, the place where we've actually held two Olympics. It's just it's a great treasure in the city. And I think uh, we're, doing, we're doing more in this city to preserve our treasures, um, to, uh, you know, tesoros. to create history. Para crear áreas históricas, yo creo que estamos cambiando en cuanto a preservar esta cuestión histórica de los antiguos. Yo apoyo esto, pero también apoyo asegurar que protejamos la cuenta de fondo general no utilizar dinero público para negociar estos planes. Los dueños billonarios tienen el dinero que necesitan para ayudar a financiar esto. Creo que esto es la manera correcta. Señor Garcetti. Gracias, señor presidente. Creo que en poco tiempo usted nos ha puesto en el mundo del mapa. En el momento donde Pasadena está creciendo rápidamente, creo que es muy importante que el país haga lo mismo. We've got to get out in front of her. We've got to make sure that Los Angeles has a unified voice, and I think this does this. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, the committee meeting, I was in, in budget uh, deliberations here, but I would have um, said just that, that while we look at and keep open other options, this is our first and our best option. This city puts us, put forward a historic um, standard for green una norma histórica para espacios verdes si miramos maneras de construcción que incluye 20 o 30 maneras de toda la basura en este país. Construir una nueva colección tiene asuntos de que si nosotros creemos o no tener lo que tenemos de reciclarlo, reutilizarlo y mejorarlo. Siempre pensamos que es mejor construir un nuevo edificio. Esto haría esto. Es decir, que tenemos un compromiso tal como tenemos en nuestros edificios municipales de tratar de utilizar los, eh, las técnicas de construcción más sensibles para el ambiente. Creo que el contenido para el efecto de esto debe ser eh, dicho por pero muchos de los, los propietarios, ellos no han hablado sobre el coliseo. Creo que deben de pasar más tiempo en la comunidad, que el concejal les dé una extorsión, que se informen acerca de esta vecindad, porque es vibrante. Hay una razón por la cual dicen que el coliseo no va a ser incluido, no tiene que ver solamente por el dinero del pueblo, sino que tiene que ver con la percepción de Sur Central o lo que es Sur Los Ángeles. Esto debe ser dicho muy claramente. Tenemos que retar a estos propietarios, muchos quienes sus equipos consisten de muchos de diferentes colores, tal como los colores de la comunidad. Ellos deben tomar parte en esta área, tal como los miembros de la comunidad también. Cuando ellos vienen a esta área, creo que ellos se darán cuenta que el coliseo, considerando el coliseo es lo mejor, y será muy... Mr. LaBange. Gracias, señor LaBange. Gracias, señor LaBange. Es no de la mesa, es de la chess. Es de la mesa y hasta la línea. Y el concejal Parks ha llevado a este punto de votación. Creo yo que es muy lindo. Yo reitero lo que dijo la señora Han, que el Coliseo es un gran estadio, es un gran campo. Nuestra primera obligación es a la Universidad del Sur de California y a sus vecinos para asegurar que ellos son como otros que usan este lugar 
But as we try to reach out to the National es muy importante, League, me mejoró esto, pero mientras nos esperamos en la NFL, es muy importante que yo sepa los sentimientos de esta ciudad. Los sentimientos son que esto es el lugar donde jugar entre el nuevo figura con la gran historia. Y este gran estadio lo honramos en memoria de los veteranos del Coliseo de Los Ángeles. Cuando ustedes pasan a través de este túnel, no de muchos, los grandes mejores atletas del mundo han pasado por este túnel a competir en este campo. Ahí es donde debe jugar, es donde el, el ya fallecido John Ferraro y todos los demás que han jugado en este lugar. Es importante decir esto ahora, miembros de la Liga de Fútbol Nacional, Jack. La NFL es una organización de 32 propietarios. Ellos van a escoger, yo espero, mi opinión, y se ocurre esto, no que ellos escojan que se ha mejorado, pero no quiero que ellos tomen algo de otra ciudad y hagan que nos se sienta como nos sentimos. Cuando quitaron los Rams, de que fueron hasta Oakland. Cuando Marcus Allen jugó con los Raiders, y tenían grandes equipos, y Jim Plunkett, y Mike Haynes, y todas esas personas que ganaron el campeonato mundial en 1983, 84, un gran tiempo, pero eso es muy importante para enviar un mensaje para la Comisión de Comisión, recibo este mensaje de mutualidad. No deben utilizar los fondos generales de impuestos. El colegio tiene impuestos del condado, tiene ingreso del condado del Estado. Aunque no sé lo que por tanto quiero ponerme de pie para apoyar este esfuerzo de la gracia, señor Parks, por lo que hace el enfoque en el colegio, porque este es un gran Estado y es donde debe de llevarse a cabo este juego, porque no hay nada más emocionante, miembros, que ir al juego a las 10 de la mañana cuando no había nada ahí solamente los pajaritos. Después los fanáticos llegaban, llenaban los asentamientos. Los pajaritos volaban a ese estado y después se iban. Mientras los fanáticos llegaban, luego los jugadores llegaban al campo y miraban esos grandes juegos. Y después, mientras todos los fanáticos se iban, los pajaritos regresaban para <risa> los cacahuates que se dejaban en, en el estadio. Muy, muy, mucha majestad y cuando se prendió el, la torcha en el coliseo, no sabía que no estaba en uno de los mejores, sino el mejor lugar en el mundo, el Coliseo. Gracias, señor presidente. Gracias, buen trabajo. Mr. Holden. Mr. President, members, uh, Los Angeles, a world-class city, city, I think not. They don't even think like a world-class city, and that's very unfortunate. Every larger, large city in the United States of America that we know of, at least, and smaller ones too, do have a football team and a basketball team and sports and economic development. It all works together for good. Mr. President, members, that uh, that was a time we didn't have the Staples Center, and I can understand the problems associated with that. But the city of Los Angeles supported that project by signing off on a bond measure that's worth over $70 million. Otherwise, the project couldn't have been developed. And all the developers had to do was submit a letter of credit guaranteeing that the bond measure would be paid off. And then this council, just the other day, rescinded the requirement that there even be a letter of credit. So therefore, the city is on the line to repay the $70 million plus if anything should happen. And then they stand here today and say, we will not use any taxpayers' money to bring in a football team. So I don't understand what kind of language they speak at a different time. I would say to you, however, that there, there are a number of teams out there who would love to come to Los Angeles. We had three major football teams. San Diego Chargers also played here. The Rams had already been mentioned played here. And the Raiders at the Coliseum. There's no finer facility anywhere in the United States of America than the Coliseum. We had an earthquake there. And we, we had a retrofit program funded by FEMA, spent over $135 million. That money was spent to make the, the, the Coliseum structurally sound to incorporate at some later date luxury boxes. I was there 
when that happened. The fact of the matter is that it is structurally sound. The ad hoc committee looked at a number of sites and they finalized on one, the Coliseum, given the fact that you're saying we're not gonna spend any taxpayers' money. If you go downtown, that's what you have to do. We can work out the same kind of arrangement, the state, the county, and the city with the joint powers agreement that we have in place. We can work out an agreement whereby we can float a bond together to entice the team to come here with the team paying their sufficient share and the rental fee will go to, to pay down the cost of the bond. Mr. President, members, a lot of folks haven't even been to the Coliseum. Here's a model of it. There's no finer facility anywhere. The largest crowd of any football team anywhere, USC, when they whip Notre Dame, is right there at the Coliseum. One beautiful stadium. There's nothing like it sitting out in the open air watching a great football team play at the Coliseum. We had two Olympics. I know, and I'm going to sit down after this, Mr. President, members. There was one individual who was honored at the Coliseum, sat on the commission. His name is Kenny Hahn. Kenny Hahn in 1935, just to get inside the Coliseum, scaled the fence. Of course, you know, they catch kids, they were kind of apprehended. He had to live with that for the rest of his life. But he enjoyed being at the Coliseum. This is it, my friends. It's the only place in the city of Los Angeles where we don't have to put our money up front, that is, our money, which is the taxpayers' money, in order to have a football team. Mr. I Holden. think it can happen. Mr. Parks, you're on the right track. You're way beyond the 50-yard line. The goal posts are at, at hand. They're right nearby. Mr. Thank Holden. You very much. Mr. Holden. Mr. Holden, you now have a one-minute debit on the next time you Oh, then you hold it over for the next time. <laughs> Ms. Gruel. Do we do that here in the city council? <laughs> we do now. <laughs> I uh, similarly want to stand up and acknowledge the leadership of Councilmember Parks on this issue and, and moving so expeditiously uh, on on this item in his uh, committee. And talked about, I know Mr. Parks has and others, the importance of this being an economic development project, not only the impact it's going to have on that community, but the region as a whole. And I think that it appropriately in the report talks about um, the importance of us being at the table to have these discussions to ensure that uh, we do have a football team here in, in Los Santos in our community. Dialogos. Now is, is the time uh, we continue to remind ourselves that we don't want to have public dollars, but it is, as Ms. Hahn mentioned, a treasure. <coughs> and I've been going there for years since I was a little kid as well, um, and went to the Olympics in 1984 and others. So many of our, our children have not been to that Coliseum. Um, unless they've been there to a, a USC game um, or a soccer game, uh, but not really a football game game since the Raiders were here. So I stand in support of Mr. Parks today and his um, a report and motion to uh, continue this dialogue and to push forward so we can um, have an opportunity to be competitive um, against some of the other uh, organizations that are in cities that are fighting for this particular um, location for an NFL team. So I just wanted to stand today and acknowledge our leadership on this, Mr. Parks. Mr. Parks. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. De parte del señor. Parks, gracias. Me presenta muy seria decir que el señor Holden hablaba acerca de de abrir las puertas. Yo tenía 15 años de edad cuando me di cuenta que se vendían boletos para ir a esos juegos. We could uh, basically no, wait for that, nor do I think we would attract any business as it relates to waiting for them to decide where the best location is. I think the fact that they are billionaires, they're going to make money regardless of the city of Los Angeles. And if they choose to place the site outside of the city of Los Angeles, we will, be, uh, we will lose because of it. And if they choose to place the site outside of the city of Los Angeles, we will lose because of it. And if they choose to place the site outside of the city of Los Angeles, we will lose because of it. Y a traer esos impuestos por 30 años que se le entregó a Inglés. Después, cuando miramos el Sports Arena, ahora no hay flujo de impuestos para mantener esto como un lugar productivo. Creo yo que esto es algo que debemos considerar para el Coliseo, sino 
Sabemos aún es que puede el flujo de ingresos y disminuirá día tras día. Y si tenemos una situación donde daños son significantes, no se pueden reparar esas barras. Eso también es muy importante considerar al tratar con estos que gastamos multimillones de dólares en eh, Exposition Park. Ya. Estamos construyendo 2,000 estacionamientos que serán parte del requisito de la NFL. Hemos tenido más de 7 millones de personas venir al Centro de Ciencia desde su apertura. Esto va a ser un gran punto de destinación para la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Sí, tuvimos más de 60 mil personas este fin de semana para la mar marcha de Red Bull. Es una indicación que al menos actualmente las personas no miran que es un factor de seguridad como muchas personas lo han pensado en el pasado, pero cuando pensamos acerca de la económica situación, las tazones, las tazones de super de fútbol se ingresa como 3 o 4 millones en los últimos años se ha logrado con 30 millones de dólares. Entonces, cuando es un gran beneficio económico para la para construir este estadio, pero el asunto principal de considerar Figueroa, King Boulevard, Exposition Boulevard, esto está siendo desarrollado para apoyar trabajos, comercios para este negocio. Esto traerá ingresos adicionales a la ciudad, particularmente con la ya de tener un transporte público en esta área, eso tiene la habilidad de Thank you, Mr. Para este reporte del comité, si procede, gracias. Nadie más dice esta presentación. Abra su voto. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes, 1 no. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 14, call special by Council Member Holden. Before advancing to item 14, 14 Mr. Reyes. Colleagues, on item 32, we have many individuals from the community, from the neighborhood council, from various agencies that have been waiting patiently, and I would ask if we can move up item 32 so that we could uh, accept their testimony. And we have a large number of people that want to speak, so appreciate that very much. If I could uh, make a motion to move 32 up, it's been seconded. Hablar sobre well, este asunto primero. Petición para tratar sobre el asunto 32 primero, sin protesta. Let's proceed then uh, to item 32. We do have speaker cards on this item. Asunto 32. Presentation first or speaker cards, Mr. Reyes? Um, let's hear from public testimony. Okay. Then we can speak after. Uh, council calls for it this time, Mr. Ken Bernstein. Sandra Bernstein, Edmund Suhu, Edmund Suhu Don, Toy, Don Toy, Christine Peters, Christine and Peters other speakers y to otros presentadores. Mr. Bernstein. Mr. Bernstein. Mr. Chair, Señor we have that forthwith on number 10. Number 10, we will send it to you, so it will be done. Okay. Good morning, Mr. President, Council Members, Ken Bernstein with the Los Angeles Conservancy. We're here this morning to strongly support Councilman Reyes uh, and his motion and commend him for his uh, leadership on, on this important issue. This motion resulted from an egregious demolition of an 1887 house on Cesar Chavez Boulevard uh, by the G.H. Palmer Company. This is uh, perhaps the last house of its kind in downtown Los Angeles, uh, a landmark remaining from the 19th century. And it was a, a demolition that occurred with no permit whatsoever. Um, it, he had been told, the developer had been told the house could not be demolished without further environmental review. And he went ahead and did it anyway on a Saturday morning. Um, any individual homeowner in this city knows that demolition cannot take place uh, uh, without a demolition permit, much less of uh, a 19th century home here in Los Angeles. And the explanations to the press thereafter by G.H. Palmer were uh, that an accident occurred or another press account indicated that uh, they thought that uh, the house had begun leaning suddenly to the west and then had to be leveled. And these are explanations that are so ridiculous as to be almost comical if they weren't, uh, in fact, so sad and, and tragic. 
what is particularly tragic here is that a preservation solution was actually within reach just two days before the demolition. We had met with Councilman Reyes's office and many city departments to relocate the home to one of our historic districts, the Angelino Heights Historic District, and that was within reach and the developer was aware of, of that progress. So in light of this egregious act, we strongly support Councilman Reyes's motion to invoke the so-called scorched earth ordinance to prevent building on this property for um, a five-year period. This was an ordinance that was passed specifically for situations like this, as well as to initiate criminal punishment. If this demolition does not result in truly significant punishment and significant repercussions, then really all of our historic buildings in the city are at risk. So the council and the city family needs to send a strong message that this will not be tolerated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Edmund Suhu, followed by Don Toy and Christine Peters. If I can ask you to come forward and please line up behind the podium. Council President Padilla, good morning and members of the city council. My name is Edmund Suhu. I'm a member of the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council as well as a longtime resident in the community where uh, the Geese House was uh, located. And I'm here today to support and applaud Councilman Ed Reyes' proposal to hold developers accountable for their actions in our communities. Our communities are of working families that don't necessarily understand or know the process of city and development, but certainly our developers are welcome to come and work with our communities for improvements and make our lives in the community better. However, development should be, and developers should be responsible for their actions. And when they make a mistake, whether it's accidental or it's just a mistake, they should be held accountable just like anyone else, including myself as a citizen. I'm accountable when I make mistakes or I break the law. They as developers with their resources and their staff should be held accountable also. And we welcome their development, but they should be responsible. And I ask you to lend your support to Councilman Ed Reyes' proposal to hold developers responsible for their actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don Toy, followed by Christine Peters, Isa Kate Mexen, and Kelly Suhu. Council President Padilla, members of uh, the council, uh, I stand before you today in support of Councilman Reyes' motion. As other speakers have indicated, uh, I've been in Chinatown my whole life, lifelong resident. I'm also the chair of the China Community Advisory Committee to the Redevelopment Project. And uh, today, I just wish to say that in our communities, and I heard many, many comments earlier about being at the table, most often, our Chinatown residents and our community is not at the table, only because we don't, again, have the opportunity, and luckily we have people like Councilman Reyes, previously Councilman Hernandez, and, and, and before that, uh, Councilwoman Molina. And without having us at the table, things just go haywire. This uh, and other developers in the community seems to think that, and I always hear how difficult it is to get things done, how, how difficult it is to want to wanna invest, the, the point of the matter is, though, that people want to go on and disregard rules and disregard conditions and things that have been set up, and we think that that's totally unfair, that this is the only way that we have an opportunity to be at the table, to be able to make sure that things don't fall, fall through the cracks. Developers always have great representatives. Unfortunately, communities, especially minority communities and communities like ourselves, where language is a big problem, it's very difficult for people to come forth and ask for your support. With that in mind, uh, again, we always like to see balanced development. We always like to see th that there is a balance overall in terms of understanding and making sure that people's rights and, and, and are heard. With that, we truly uh, hope that you will support this particular motion and that we're, again, hopeful that this motion will send a strong message to any and all developers that we all have rules and we must uh, abide by them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christine Peters. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Christine Peters, and I'm a representative of the Echo Park Elysian Neighborhood Council. I want to especially thank the council member for taking the ball and running with this. There were so many um, distressed, angry citizens in the community, people who drove by this property on a daily basis, and were, were absolutely stunned to see that it was so um, wantonly and willfully destroyed uh, without city permits, and yet again, um, assuming that nothing was going to happen to the contractor. We are 
so happy to see that this item has been brought up. We want to please recommend that the council um, pass this recommendation and that perhaps if we could add one thing in, which would be that if, if we do enforce this ordinance and ask that the property, you know, the, the developer not be able to develop for five years, that in some way he is required to give back to the community um, sort of in the way the Echo Park uh, Community Garden came about. Um, some kind of a land exchange where we either give it to the kids, build a ball field, open space, uh, community garden, in, in some part of the development of that parcel so that this developer and every developer after him who does destroy public or historic property will know that they will be punished and, and have to give back to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is Issa Kay still here? I think she's left. Oh, Issa Kay. We have a substitute speaker. Yes, um, <laughs> Welcome, I'll Judith. A very quick substitute. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'm a resident of that neighborhood. We have worked so hard to try to preserve that neighborhood, and to see that house go down was truly an outrage, to use Issa Kay's words. I, I, too, like Christina, would like to see something done that's beneficial with that area. If it lies fallow for five years, it could be made into perhaps a temporary field. And so that's what um, I'm asking for, and I know the community is so thankful to Ed Reyes for supporting this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kelly Suhu, to be followed by uh, Kevin Kuzma. My name is Kelly Suhu. As a member of the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council and longtime member of Chinatown, in times like today when people of power and influence are taking advantage of our community, whether it's the Neighborhood Council and the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment appointing our members instead of allowing our community to elect its own representatives to J.H. Palmer taking advantage of our community, the Chinatown youth are proud and thankful that Mr. Ed Reyes is standing up for what is right and standing up for the historic culture of our community. And the Chinatown youth support you, Mr. Ed Reyes, and urge the board to support this motion for a scorched earth ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin Kuzma to be followed by uh, Jim Childs. Morning, members of the City Council. My name is Kevin Kuzma. I'm speaking for you this morning as uh, the president of the Echo Park Historical Society as a developer who's been involved with a historic house move and as a proud Angelino. Unless you vote yes this morning, this demolition has the potential to set a terrible precedent citywide for all of our historic resources, official or not. The developers of this project, GH Palmer Associates, have said effectively that they've done the community a favor by tearing down an eyesore. This house only became an eyesore or a nuisance under their watch. It was occupied up until they took over. It served as low-income housing, along with the houses around it that completed the block. Uh, all of it was evicted uh, by the developer, and uh, during their ownership it was evicted. I'm sorry, it was uh, vandalized. And we ask that you vote yes on this this morning uh, to enforce the Scorched Earth Ordinance to the full extent possible. It has been said that only this small part of the lot may be affected by the ordinance. I would ask that you still vote yes if that's the case. Uh, if not, the developer also has the potential to lose tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of potential rental income. Uh, should the opportunity arise, perhaps a settlement can be made between the city and the developer to fund historic resources surveys in the center of the city. This developer is working in the center of the city, the most historic part of the city. And right now, we as citizens, as the city, don't know the resources that we have. There's very few places that have been assessed officially. Uh, this house actually had been. It was found to be potential for eligibility as a national landmark. The only reason it didn't happen was because no one had completed the paperwork. Uh, we ask that you vote yes on this item and continue to explore any options for assessing what we have out there, because every day in Los Angeles, we don't know what we're losing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate your testimony. Jim Childs. Uh, good morning, Jim Childs. Adams Dockweiler Heritage, uh, CD1. Uh, I'm here today to also add our organization's uh, request that you support the motion by Councilman Reyes. Um, I've been here before on 
historic demolitions. In fact, uh, there are a few of you left who might remember going back to the McKinley where Scorch Church came from in 1990. And again in 1992 when Councilman Hernandez uh, brought forth the issues uh, with a demolition on my own street on Scar Street, the Hodgman House. And I was here last year uh, when USC illegally demolished a house over on 30th Street. The time has come to put an end. And I think if you don't do it now with, with something as symbolic as the last house on Bunker Hill and the arrogance in which it's destroyed, then probably you're not going to do it. You have the tools, and I ask you to act on those tools. Uh, Mr. Holden talked about a world-class city with a football team. World-class cities are also judged by how they steward their historic resources. And I ask you all to be good stewards. I know Councilman uh, Reyes is mad. I know I'm mad. I know the preservation community is mad. And I hope each and every single council member is mad. And I ask you, um, as in a scene from a movie, which is what I do for a living sometimes, I ask you to stand and, and be mad and tell Mr. Palmer that you're mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore. Please. Thank you very much. Appreciate the testimony and the illusion. Um, before we go to our speakers, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Gruel for a quick introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Garcetti. I would just like to introduce um, one person, is Donald Dickerson, who is a commissioner for the state of California for Building Standards Commission, who is here and also um, a constituent of mine in the San Tahunga area, but also to ask um, the group American Legion Post 546 that's here taking a tour of City Hall, if you would all stand and recognize you all today, our Legionnaires. Thank you for being here and all that you've done to, uh, for our country, and we really appreciate your uh, coming in and listening to us here in City Council. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much, much Councilmember Gruel, and, and thank you all for being here as well. Our first speaker on the issue is Councilmember Reyes, to be followed by Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Council President. I'd like to call a building on safety and the staff that was working with our office. Council colleagues, I can understand when someone says we didn't know we weren't aware, but the fact is that Thursday before they bulldozed the home, we had building and safety, CRA, my office, and other folks involved, HPLZ folks. We had a destination. It was going to be moved up on Sunset. We had a location. We had funding. Everything was put together to save this home. The bottom line is I believe we need housing for all people. We need it. We do need high income, we need moderate income, we need low income, we need housing for our firefighters, for our police, for our, teacher, our teachers. We want a 24-hour city. That I truly believe in. But let's not do it this way. Let's not allow developers to come in and say they're going to have it their way, that they're tired or whatever it is, excuse they have, it was an accident, and bulldoze historic homes. We have a law in place. As was mentioned, Councilmember Gloria Molina at that time put together and enacted the Scorched Earth Ordinance. It's a measure, it's a policy that holds people accountable. And we need to let everyone know that our history does matter. Our history can be interpreted through our architecture, our housing, our neighborhoods. And that's being erased without a second thought, and that should not be allowed. Mr. Kime, can you just tell us where we were at and, and the elements for our ability to inject or invoke this scorched earth policy? Sure. Uh, good morning, Mr. President, council members. My name is Dave Kime, and I'm the chief of Building and Safety's Code Enforcement Bureau. Uh, there's actually two enforcement options that we have in this instance. Uh, the first is we can request the city attorney uh, to file a criminal complaint against the owner of the property for failure to secure a demolition permit prior to the demolition. And of course, the second track is the um, uh, so-called scorched earth ordinance, which gives the department the authority after hearing to, um, and if after hearing the determination is made that the demolition was done without, uh, without permits, 
um, use the department the authority to uh, impose um, uh, a no permit issuance on that property for up to five years and an affidavit recorded on the title of the property indicating that for any p potential uh, buyers or investors as well. Thank you. The motion also requests that the city attorney file criminal charges given the experience, the process we had been going through. And I truly believe that this is the only way we get our message across that our communities and our neighborhoods do matter. You know, this building was, born, uh, was put together in 1887, I believe. It was part of the park track that was laid out by Prudent and Victor Beaudry. It was the last remaining structure. And the anger that I feel is one in which there's a wholesale disrespect for history un, uh, in the way this particular developer has conducted his business, the way he's engaged in office, the way he has treated the community. And we can't let that happen. We need to send a lot of message, and I uh, encourage your support, and letting everyone know that our investment as a city and our history is truly an important one. But I also want to echo the fact that we need housing for everyone, high income, as well as low income, to make a thousand dollars a city for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Holden. Mr. Reyes, I would like to ask the Reyes, I recognize your frustration. I've had it over and over again when Yo I first was elected. Primero me and prior there too. For an example, with a ejemplo, beautiful facility, nice home, in the Waha area, West Adams Heritage Association, at the corner of Arlington, Mr. Parks, de Arlington Senior Parks, at the corner of Arlington de, de and Adams, Arlington y Adams, and they decided they're going to put decidieron. a little school there. Bungalow escuela, schools, escuela, and they knocked that house down. Derrumbe, Today they couldn't casa. do that. Hoy, but then they did. Que no it was a hacer, loss lo to that community forever. Para la That's just one example. Es un the other example at the corner of Pico, Pico and Fairfax, y Fairfax, when you go west and south, with beautiful homes, a nice environment, casas nice bien, family, bien, zone R3. And the developers are going in there bulldozing down there those homes. And we had an interim control ordinance established that says that no more permits to demolish, which probably could have saved that in my entire district, in order to save those homes there in the Windsor Village area as well. Well, the mayor vetoed that. And some environmentalists who sat in the council at the time, and Ms. Biscoski knows one of them, voted to sustain the mayor's veto, and the very next day, they went and destroyed that neighborhood and knocked those homes down. Beautiful homes. Now what you have there is a bunch of an apartment buildings that's bringing in a lot of trouble into the people who now live there in that general area. But it's destroyed. And so we have to be really continually mindful of the fact that, yes, we want more affordable housing. Yes, we want to build more residences. But certainly Eso not at the expense of taking away this very fine facility no and destroying neighborhoods de in the future as they did, did then in my district. Futuro, so this is just, just the beginning. You'll see it all over again. Uh, but this legal investigation, the pursuit for justice, is an issue that's well taken, and I support you in that effort. Let's get them and cuff them. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Uh, we'll put that 30 seconds back in the bank, too. Mr. Zine. Thank you. Um, I remember uh, at the end of last year, there was an industry that tried to put up billboards in areas that they weren't permitted. There was a hue and cry. Councilman Bernson had action taken against that legitimate business that was involved in something that wasn't legitimate. And what I find disturbing with this is it's a legitimate developer who's done work in the city, as I understand, that did this action. While there are sanctions to be imposed, I would wish that they would all be imposed. Have we ever had problems with this developer in the past with any activities that weren't in the legitimate nature? Uh, secondly, if that property is left 
in ruin for the next five years? Does that then become an eyesore for the community? Does it get overgrown with weeds? Since they can't do anything with it, what happens with the property for the next five years? If you could please answer those questions. Um, first of all, uh, Councilman Zayn, I'm not aware of any past history with this developer in terms of de demolishing without permits or similar types of violations. And uh, I believe your second question was what will happen with this lot if, if we don't allow it to be built. It's basically a vacant lot right now. There is a fence. It's actually a part, um, it's, it's adjacent to several vacant lots. There's something like six or eight vacant lots surrounding this property. Um, and there is, although there's a fence around it, it's not the best maintained fence at times. Will it become a problem? Um, in my experience, it probably will become a problem for excessive vegetation, weeds, trash, debris, and dumping uh, at some point. That's our history with these kinds of lots, and um, that's what we would anticipate. And that's a concern I have for an area that they're trying to maintain and improve while the developer illegally tears down the structure. Now the community is going to be faced with even more of a nuisance, more of a problem if it becomes a homeless encampment, if it becomes overgrown with reeds and infestation. I mean, what can the city do to put a pocket park or do something for the five years so it doesn't become an eyesore for the community? Well, in terms of um, maintaining the lot, we will, the department will monitor this lot um, indefinitely um, to ensure that it, it, it is maintained uh, clean and secure. If, if, it, if, if at any time uh, there's trash on it or weeds, et cetera, or, or the fence is broken into, what do the owner repair it? And if he doesn't do that, we have the authority to do that work ourselves, and we impose that cost on the title of the property as an assessment eventually um, as a lien. Um, so we can do that uh, in terms of the city providing a pocket park. I mean, it's, it's privately owned property right now. Well, it's, it's privately owned property, and we have sanctions for the next five years which prevent the owner from doing anything with that property, correct? It prevents the department, specifically the ordinance prevents the department, if it's imposed, uh, from issuing any permits for the development of the property. So that means that it's going to remain in its current state for the next five years. If, in fact, this is imposed, yes. Okay, is, is there any question that what was being alleged, and I'm not familiar other than what I've read in documents and her testimony, is there any question that uh, this man followed the rules and there's a mistake, or is it clear that this man violated the rules, this developer violated the rules? Well, I know you're innocent until proven guilty, but you would know more than me. In fact, Councilman, I'd rather not make the comment until the hearing is held on this case. Plus, there's a criminal prosecution in okay. progress, so I'd rather not discuss those details at this point. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zion. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to stand and say um, that I really, uh, I just wanted to echo what a member of the community said when uh, he got up and said, thank you, Mr. Reyes, for doing what's right on behalf of the community. And you know, I just, I just asked Mr. Reyes a question, if this was the first time that this ordinance has been invoked since I've been on the council and he and I have been on the council, and he said this is the first time this ordinance has been invoked, period. And this is unfortunate, but it is absolutely the necessary test case for this ordinance for the rest of the city. Um, so thanks to everyone from the community who came. Thanks to Mr. Bernstein from the Conservancy. And thank you, Mr. Reyes, for, for stepping up to the plate on this, because it's a difficult issue. Uh, it's going to be in the legal arena, and, uh, and we'll hope the prosecutors do the right thing with it. Uh, and pursue justice, but thank you for bringing this up. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Mr. Bernson. <clears throat> I believe that this uh, policy came into policy. effect after the McKinley Mansion, uh, which we were uh, instrumental in saving the mansion, not on that site, however. Uh, we caught the developer trying to destroy it, and we managed to save the mansion, but uh, it was moved from that site. Uh, I, I applaud Ed for bringing this in. I just wonder whether we have enough tools to deal with things like this in the future. Uh, you know, we're saying it can be, the scorched earth policy can be applied up to five years. 
Uh, well, I don't know if that's a penalty enough, to be honest with you. I, I just wonder, and, and whether whether we're giving that option to, uh, who are we giving the option to on this, Dave? I'm, 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 I don't know if I understand the question. The, the option to in terms of, of, of how many years there will be uh, held in scorched earth uh, well, We've asked the city attorney, the, the, the ordinance itself, Councilman, is, is a discretionary it's ordinance. It says, it doesn't say, say that the department it's shall it's invoke it. It says we shall have the authority to invoke it. It says further, we shall have the authority to record this affidavit on the title for five years. Uh, in terms of whether or not we can limit that uh, less than five years, we have that question before the city attorney. Well, I just wonder whether Ed would accept a uh, federal amendment that uh, we instruct the city attorney uh, we, that there shall be a minimum of five years restriction on any use of this property and uh, that the property shall be maintained at the owner's expense, and if it is not done, then the property shall be taken care of by our public works department and, and leaned in order to make sure the city recovers any uh, loss of funds. This, we need to send a strong message here. Uh, this is the first time in a long time that this has happened, and I can't believe that the owner was not, this is a builder who has done business in the city before and other areas. I can't believe they were not aware of the fact they have to have a demolition committee. So I, I just hope that we're going to proceed with the strongest type of measure we can. I, I believe, unfortunately, this is only a misdemeanor. Is that correct? Um, yeah, the, in terms of the criminal charge that we're asking the city attorney to file, uh, it's punishable by a maximum um, uh, of $1,000 on our six months for each kind of violation, which is a misdemeanor in the state of California. Yeah. Unfortunately, we can't do more than that, but I would hope that whatever, whatever this Whenever Cuando the city attorney takes this criminal charge, that he will press for the six months in prison. And let's make an example of this so that it doesn't happen again. You accept my amendment on that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brunson. Ms. Miskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I share the sentiments expressed uh, both by Mr. Reyes and the community, and I think uh, how there should be another amendment. I think we should uh, look to amend the ordinance so it doesn't say the department may withhold a building permit, but it says the department shall withhold a building permit in all future cases where we find this. This is called the scorched earth ordinance for a reason. It really does scorch the earth, take something that was precious away from it. We do have two other applications of a withhold the permit for five years that have been invoked, not under a historic designation. But at least, well, one other at least, on the issue of demolition of apartments. We passed many years ago as a city council an ordinance requiring relocation assistance to be given to tenants in a building if it was going to be demolished or something new was going to be built there. Uh, and in that ordinance, I believe it does say that the department shall withhold a building permit on the premise if the no, owner cannot prove that relocation was given to the previous tenants who occupied it. So that one is a shall, and it is invoked, and has been invoked. And we've also invoked it. I have a case uh, now in, um, in Mr. Zion's district in Woodland Hills, where we had a specific plan, and the zoning administrator went through a process of saving some oak trees under the Girard track. This uh, similar situation, the oak trees uh, on the property were marked to be saved. There was a line on them. Somebody came through and cut down the oak trees. They were dumb enough to cut the oak trees down above the line, which marked the trees that were to be saved. So you saw there the stumps with a mark on them saying to be saved, and it was, it was and the zoning administrator came right in and invoked a five-year penalty on that property to not be built for a single-family house. So we have invoked it. We need to invoke it. Subject to the findings here, I have no problem with the two amendments on um, imposing the maximum restriction on, not, on a non-build on this property. And, and literally over over time, let's amend this ordinance so that this is not discretionary. When found fault, is an automatic five-year suspension of any permits being issued for building on the site. It truly is the only way we can not only teach um, the people involved in this particular case the lesson as to what the city means, but it really will send a very, very, very strong message across the development community that this is not something to toy with when those designations occur and those rules are imposed. 
Thank you, Ms. Miskowski. Mr. Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, I wanted to rise uh, yes to support uh, Councilmember Reyes and the motion before us uh, and, and to commend him for responding so quickly and so firmly uh, with this, to this egregious action. Uh, but colleagues, I wanted to bring to all of our attention and to the attention of the public uh, sort of a macro observation of what's going on here. Far too often, uh, this city council and individual members of this council get pegged, get labeled, get attacked uh, or accused of rolling over for developers or being in the pockets of developers or to, uh, that we don't stand up to proposed development and we don't advocate enough on behalf of the community. Uh, once in a blue moon, we have a big issue, an egregious issue such as today that does highlight the fact that council members do say no, council members do fight back. And it happens more often than we read about. The public doesn't see or hear when we say no to developers in our office. The public doesn't see when we push back or when we force developers into a compromise because that's what's best for the community. And so in addition to, uh, again, supporting the motion before us and, and council member Reyes in this quest, I think uh, uh, it's appropriate to acknowledge it just as an example of the give and take that happens on a daily basis in each council district and in each council office. Uh, because we are concerned about the future of our city, we are concerned about the future uh, and the growth uh, of specific communities. So for all the times that uh, we're, it's said that each council district is a fiefdom and we're each in charge of our own fiefdom, uh, in a negative way, there is a positive piece to that. There is a positive in the sense that we know our districts, we know them well, and we know what's good for the community, uh, and we know what's not. And on many of occasions, we'll work with the developer to try to uh, accept development proposals that are win-win for the community. But on occasions, there's times to say no, there's times to push back. And in this case, given the actions and the behavior of this developer, it's not only enough to push back, it's time to fight back, and that's what's happening. Uh, under Mr. Reyes leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. Next, I would like to recognize council member from the 4th District, Mr. Labange. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, this is very sad that someone would do that to us. I remember we were moving houses off of uh, Bunker Hill in the early 70s. And, uh, right by Felipe's, they parked uh, a grand old Victorian there, and it was torched and burnt and was lost. It was on its way to Heritage Square uh, on that. But this particular building could have been found a place and found it a home and found it the love that it needs. And you can't duplicate that. So it's very sad that someone would do this uh, to the property, so I support this here. I would just like to also ask Mr. Kine, do we have an inventory or is our cultural affairs department? There are many more buildings like this out here. I just want to learn from this horrible experience. Should we be more aggressive in saying that has a potential uh, that may or may not be on the historic registration list? Well, I believe the cultural her uh, heritage does have uh, a list of buildings that are listed as having historical significance or, or Oh, I know that, but you, uh, you're building department. You're out there every day. You're the eyes and ears. Yes, whenever there, whenever there's a building that has it registered, we, uh, that's marked on the city maps, and we're able to pick that up when permit applications come in so that we see that they get the proper level of review before they make alterations. I think it's important to clarify the existing ordinance uh, as it's written right now is not, is not limited to just historical buildings. Uh, the department has the authority to impose this uh, scorched 
administer the ordinance on any demolition on any building in the city. So if there is a consideration to um, uh, make this a requirement that we impose it, I think there needs to be probably some more discussion on what limitation on demolition. Well, it's unusual for an entire building to be demolished without permits. It's not unusual at all for people to alter existing buildings and do partial demolitions. So I think we need to really take a look at whether we want to make that an absolute requirement for all levels of demolition. Now, Mr. Kahn, you call it scorch the earth? Scorched earth ordinances. See, I like the earth, so I think you should scorch the person who did wrong. So I think we should change the ordinance from scorch the earth to scorch the person who did wrong, or persons. Uh, and that ref, uh, ref, uh, reflection there. And I also want to say, members, I've uh, talked about uh, a housing court uh, to focus uh, these type of issues on. I support, you know, the neighborhood prosecutor program, but not only on that aspect, I'm just making a little play on this, that there, there be, because, uh, Cindy, you mentioned about those oak trees, that there be in the seven regional areas of the city a prosecutor from the city attorney's office who followed the planning department and the building department and hand in hand on these issues because sometimes those neighborhood prosecutors get tied up in a lot of uh, various quality of life issues and if they were focused just on the, the building and land use issues, I think they'd be more effective tool. I thank you and I think it should be scorched the guy who, who did it wrong and, 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 and yeah, because the earth is too good to all of us, it should be anyway. Thank you, Mr. President. You're a Rhodes Scholar. Figure the term. Thank you, Tom Leviticus Labange. All right, Mr. Reyes. Maybe it should be Scorch the Violator. No. Um, I, I do want to say thank you to the community, Mr. Bernstein, everyone that came out. Um, thank you for your support. And colleagues, I, I do hope we can send a loud message. I hope it does not get misinterpreted. We are struggling. We have some challenges before us when it comes to housing, promoting housing in our districts, in the city, making the city of LA, downtown a 24-hour city. All of those things are important. All those things I support. But there's a reason why we have laws. There are communities we need to respect. There's a history we need to preserve. When I look at it, I look at our young people. If we can point to homes and talk about the history of a neighborhood, and talk about things as intangible as self-esteem and pride in the community, a sense of history, it's our structures that do that. And if we eliminate those, we eliminate that opportunity to demonstrate and show our young people about those kinds of historic landmarks that do mean something to us as we grow, as we become mature, and as we evolve as a city. So for those reasons, I hope you can support me again. Thank you, folks, for coming down. And, uh, let's send a loud statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. Uh, final speaker, Mr. Holden, for a second time. Uh, Mr. City Attorney. It just seems to me that it's not enough of a penalty to say you can't develop the property within five years. Uh, I, I think if you can find a way to continue to assess the property at its current assessment value with the improvements as if they were still there, then of course that developer is spending some additional funds. Uh, they perhaps will go to the county and say, now nah, reappraise this property, reassess this property, there are no improvements. And yet they violate the city law by removing the improvements. Has anything to be done in that regard, if, it's, if at all? Uh, Council, I'm not sure. Perhaps we could pose that question to the city attorney's office. Oh, yes, right. You do. Good. Good. Yeah, I think that as we ask the city attorney to look into the matter, that might be something that they should consider because it's a difference in the tax assessment of the property when the improvements are gone. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Uh, council members, seeing no other colleagues wishing to speak, can Madam Clerk please let us know what's before us. Uh, there are two amendments, and I believe both were accepted as friendly amendments. Uh, first one, Mr. Bernson's amendment to request the city attorney to impose a minimum of five years and also to require that the uh, property owner maintain the property at the owner's expense. And if not, then uh, the city would clean it and a lien would be imposed. And also, Councilmember Mississippi's motion to uh, amend the ordinance uh, to, instead of uh, may withhold billing permit to uh, substitute shall. 
excluir de okay. los Those have both been accepted as friendly amendments. Right. Madam Clerk, if you please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is passed unanimously. Forthwith, please, on that. Mr. President, members, Mr. President, we've been taking items out of order. Item 27 was held over from last week because we didn't get to it. The gentleman from the city attorney's office, he's a high paid personnel, sat here for over four hours, and he's again four hours a day. Uh, it's an easy item. He's just going to give us a report. Can we take item 27? There's no objection, colleagues. We'll take item 27 out of order as our next. Uh, yeah, we've done forthwith on that, Mr. Mr. Brinson. Oh, 19, forthwith on 19 as well. Um, Mr. City Attorney, please. Okay, good morning. James Axtell, Deputy City Attorney. Not that well paid, unfortunately, Mr. Holden. Um, this was uh, simply a report that we had made to the Public Safety Committee concerning a recent decision by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in which the court uh, upheld almost uh, in whole, the state of California's uh, regulations concerning the possession and sale of assault weapons. The reason that we had uh, uh, brought the report forward is because the court, in upholding the regulations, uh, discussed a number of federal constitutional issues that seems to always come up whenever uh, firearm regulations are being considered. And so we wanted the council to know about those. Uh, basically, there were three of those uh, important issues that the court discussed. Uh, one was the Second Amendment issue, the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, the second was an equal protection issue that came up in the context of uh, exemptions to the uh, prohibitions and the regulations. And the third was a takings clause issue, the takings clause being uh, the clause in the Fifth Amendment, which says that if the government takes your property uh, it must uh, make just compensation for that. With respect to the Second Amendment issue, the Ninth Circuit has held now that the Second Amendment does not include a personal individual right to bear arms. Uh, in the view of the Ninth Circuit, the Second Amendment is a uh, right of the state uh, in relation to the keeping of a state militia. And so individuals are not able to come forward and make the argument that they have Second Amendment rights, which may uh, cause a particular regulation concerning firearms to be unconstitutional. Um, it's important to understand that this decision is not necessarily the same as the decision of the other federal circuit courts. So there is a, a split in the authority. Uh, the Supreme Court has not taken up the issue yet. They may take up the issue sometime soon. However, for now, we can follow the Ninth Circuit's decision, and uh, the city does not have to concern itself with a Second Amendment issue at this point. Uh, with regard to the equal protection issue, the plaintiffs argued that some of the exemptions uh, to the regulations were unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. The court agreed with them as to one of those exemptions, which was the exemption for retired police officers. Uh, the court held that uh, there was no rational basis for um, allowing retired police officers not to be subject to the regulations when ordinary people were. Um, so that's an issue that uh, we would have to keep in mind or should keep in mind uh, whenever we're considering uh, firearms regulations in the future. The most important issue uh, for, in terms of how it may affect the city's consideration of future regulations uh, was the takings clause issue. Uh, the plaintiffs argued that with, res with respect to persons who own or possess firearms at the time that they become illegal to possess, uh, have Por suffered a taking uh, because the government has, in essence, not allowed them to use their property anymore. Uh, in the state regulations, there's a grandfather clause that allows people who own weapons at the time that they are made illegal to continue to own them if they are willing to register them with the state and if they are willing to only use them for certain very limited purposes. Uh, so because of those, that grandfather clause, the uh, court upheld the regulations and said there, that there was not any taking. Um, the problem for the city is that we cannot uh, use that same kind of grandfather clause because the state of California has already made it clear uh, pursuant to statute 
that uh, it is the only one that can uh, enact legislation concerning licensing or permitting of firearms. So that's an issue uh, that we would have to figure out some way to address each time that we uh, want to uh, enact some kind of regulation concerning the possession of firearms. Uh, those are basically the issues that the court addressed there. The court did not address the issue, the other main issue that we always have, which is the state law preemption issue, the question of what are we allowed to regulate when the state uh, has engaged in uh, regulation. Um, but we wanted the court, we wanted the uh, council to know about uh, these other issues which will come up as you consider future uh, firearms regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Any members wishing to be heard on this? Yeah. Mr. Holden. Uh, Mr. Today and some time ago, Mr. Rigley Thomas introduced a motion addressing the issue of 50 caliber semi automatic weapons. And today there's another motion coming through to do the same thing, asking that the state, not that we in the city of Los Angeles are prohibiting and uh, making it a law that you cannot possess, own, or buy such a weapon, but to ask the state to support that kind of legislation. Now, is the Pero state prohibited from that type of weapon? Does this type of weapon fall in the assault de weapon de category? Uh, currently, there are some 50 caliber weapons that would be included as assault weapons because of the features that those weapons have. It's possible, however, that there are some 50 caliber weapons that currently are not regulated by the assault weapons uh, regulations that were at issue in this case. Um, I believe that's the reason that the state is currently considering passing new legislation to uh, uh, increase the number, the the uh, categories of 50 caliber weapons that will be subject to regulation. Oh, you're, you're answering a question why the time is running. That's okay. My question is then, uh, it doesn't fall within the assault weapon category is what you're saying. The 50 caliber machine gun was this big. Well, a machine gun would be a machine gun and it's it's illegal under another uh, regulation. Semi-automatic, semi-automatic. Same as this uh, AK-47, semi-automatic. I think the best answer I can give you is there are some 50 caliber weapons that are currently not prohibited pursuant to the assault weapons regulations of the state. There are some that are, but there are some that are not. Okay, now the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, that where you got your information from? Yes. Court. And you also said that there are other circuit courts uh, took uh, just an opposing position. Where are those courts and what states do they represent? The most recent uh, decision taking the opposite view is the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which includes Texas and Oklahoma and some other states. And what are the positions they, they took? Uh, that court held that there is a personal, individual right to bear arms under the Second Amendment. Notwithstanding the weapon, assault weapon, etc., just arms in general. Yes, the court did not go into great detail into how it would figure out what the exact parameters of that right are. It simply held that it believed that there is a right to keep and bear arms and it uh, is something that a, an individual would be able to assert uh, in, in, a, in defense of uh, being charged with some kind of weapons crime. Okay, was there any such law passed in that area by any state uh, using similar to what we passed in the state of California, which caused that action to be taken, take, taken by that court? Uh, I don't believe that that had to do specifically with an assault weapons issue. It was an issue of whether or not a convicted person was allowed to continue to possess firearms. Well, it's a different case altogether. That's not apples and bananas. Uh, the two cases, uh, whereas we in the state of California talked about assault weapons and, and cooperate what is known as the grandfather clause for those who had to possess weapon only required to register the weapon after the date it became law compared to some ex-convict possessing just a weapon in general. Uh, when this argument gets to the United States Supreme Court, they're looking at two different arguments. Uh, felon possessing a weapon and just assault weapons in general. Uh, I get, you can't forecast what the outcome is going to be, but certainly the approach to the defense, or, uh, the, the state's position should be different because there are two different sets of circumstances. Would you agree to that? Well, I think that the first issue the court would have to figure out is whether it thinks there is a uh, personal right to keep and bear arms. And then 
the court would have to figure out exactly what the parameters are of that right. In other words, when the government would be able to regulate and how they would be able to regulate. And then once it did that, it would be able to determine how that right applies to either assault weapons regulations or to other regulations affecting convicted felons. As you explained it to me, the state of California law clearly states that you right to bear arms, but under certain circumstances and certain weapons after a certain given date period. And the date is... Uh, you cannot have assault weapons after that becomes law, and those who have the assault weapons prior to their legislation becoming law, then they would be grandfathered in. So they didn't say you can't have it. Is that correct? I, I believe, if I understood you right, I believe that's correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Holden. Ms. Miskowski. Basically, I just want to uh, thank Mr. Holden for letting this be discussed. We had a good discussion of public safety. What we learned is that some of the recent court cases have allowed the state of California and to some degree the city of Los Angeles to go further in regulation of firearms than we previously thought. Uh, that there is less impediment in terms of the federal side, a little more concern or question about what the state does, but as long as we keep getting our state legislators putting in the good bills that we we are supporting, Continue which is the motion that Mr. Holden uh, agreed to sign today, seconding on the 50 caliber ban. It goes further than the earlier one. The early, earlier one was promoting uh, the ban on what might be called 50 caliber assault weapons. Uh, because there is a loophole, and as we learn this jargon, uh, there are weapons of 50 caliber that bueno, may not ahí, technically be considered que que assault, assault weapons. Que no será so this como motion today and in support of the state legislation is going to support the two pieces of legislation that deal with the non-assault 50 caliber weapons. And I think we will uh, hopefully see passage of that at the state level, but we want to have the city de in support no of it. Pues so we are keep keeping our eye on this and we will uh, continue to pursue this uh, as far as we can. Mr. Holden, we are keeping our eye on this and we will continue to pursue this as far as we can. Within the regulations that are reasonable within the regulations that get upheld in court to try to pursue uh, as avidly as possible the banning of the type of weapons and ammunition that we know can be doing harm in our city. And uh, so we keep a, sort of a tally running in the Public Works Committee uh, and work very closely with the city attorney who gives us the reports and tells us where that latitude uh, is allowed and can take us in terms of support for legislation that is both pending in Sacramento and which we the city ourselves might consider. So um, it was a good status report as a consequence of knowing some of those things falling through the cracks. We are bringing in the motions to support the legislation that closed those loopholes. Thank you very much. Any other members wishing to be heard? Not? I'll uh, note and file this, Mr. Holden. President, members, I just wanted to share this with the... Can you press your button one more time, Mr. Holden? I did. I, did. I want to share this with the public and with the attorney, uh, it's a People magazine. And in the 1989, it was the beginning of the ban of the assault weapons. Uh, there stands the city council member, I won't mention the name, with a bunch of them. AK-47 and Uzis around him that he had purchased and not even shredded. And that was the beginning of the ban of the assault weapons. In fact, the city council, along with Zevi Aslavsky and myself, urged the, but to impose the first ban. And we had the right to do that because the state had not preempted us at that time, uh -huh. local government. And now the state has preempted us, and so we can recommend and suggest as we're doing with Ms. Misakasi's bill. So the city has always been out front, first on the front line in order to uh, control the influx of these assault weapons in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you very much, Mr. Holden. Ms. Miskowski, for example. That same unmentioned council member had a buyback program a few years back in City Hall when we were in this building. And I, at that time, was a staff member with council member Browdy. And was rather frightened as I was walking down the corridors of City Hall with people coming to the council member's office to get the money for the buyback. And these people were carrying weapons, large rifles, walking into City Hall to get to the council's office to get the, the buyback coupon for these weapons. Uh, I don't know that that particular program could work anymore today with our secu heightened security, but it was successful, and he had people coming into City Hall with these weapons to turn them in to get the, the, uh, the rebate and, and the buyback. But uh, so that 
Our Our colleague has been in the forefront of this for quite some time. Thank you. I know he's been trying to buy back Mr. Zion's weapon for some time, but unsuccessfully. All right, we have the committee report before us. Uh, please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Okay, that is noted, noted and filed. Next item, please. Item number 14, which calls special by Council Member Holden. Uh, Mr. Holden. Mr. Holden. Item 14. I'm going to make this really quick and give back some time. Button. We're going to have a report. We'll have a report. This is a motion introduced by Mr. Hernandez and Ms. Goldberg uh, a long time ago as it relates to providing funding for after school programs. And uh, it was received in Bala. It was held up. How many years ago might you guys do this? 1995, 1996 budget. And as you will discover that. Sometimes you put a motion in and refer to during the budget discussion. You refer to the finance committee and it never gets out. So therefore, you never know what's done regarding the fact that we need these kind of programs at various schools where there is no park. The idea was that in a community where there is no park within a certain number of miles or so on, the schools would stay open from after school for recreational purposes. And the city of Los Angeles would fund those programs. We would like to have a status report before we receive and file this report. This is from uh, the, the budget 1995-96, uh, Mr. Holden. Um, so we'll hear now from the CAO's office on this, on the update, okay? In, in 1994 through 1996, our budget provided $3.5 million for the um, LAUSD Extended Day and Weekend Recreational Program. Uh, the funding was eliminated in 96, fiscal year 96 and 97, and then 98 and 99. However, funding was reinstated for fiscal years 97 through 98 and then fiscal year 99 and, and 00. Subsequent to the 99-00 budget, LAUSD agreed to continue the program to maintain its current level of service. Um, following that decision, the mayor and council funded LA's best program for approximately a million dollars a year. Now, LAUSD does have a program called Beyond the Bell, which represents their um, you know, their effort to, to continue this program, but it's, it is funded through LAUSD dollars. Thank you for that update, LA Best is not the same as the after school program. But, but the, the Beyond the Bell program is a, um, Beyond the Bell, as in the closing bell of school, is, is um, LAUSD's program for extended, some extended services. The reason why I raised the question, Mr. Puchero, is that is the city of Los Angeles position still the same as it was before? Shall it always be to provide a recreational environment for after school children? And when you say we gave it to LA Best, that's not the same thing. And when we're giving it, we, depending on the LA Unified School District, it's crying for money. Is that the same thing? We don't know. And if it I isn't, your point. If it isn't then, then what is the commitment of the city of Los Angeles that then and now? We had a good program in place, and then they stopped funding it. And that's what we're talking about. Are there any funds or is there any assurance that those recreational programs are in place today? If the answer is no, then it's something we might have to look at. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes, Holden. Uh, we have the item before us. Please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 13 items. That updated item is received this and filed. Received Next item, please. Item number 17, call special by Council Member Parks. Okay. Mr. Parks. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had a, I think this is a continuance from a week or so ago. And I think most uh, questions were from myself and Mr. Holden. You can uh, give us some information on how contractors can get involved in, on the pre-qualified list and how they would go about it. And, Get the training and variety of things of that nature. Uh, yes, Councilman. Uh, the housing department is a lender. We make loans to low-income homeowners who want to repair single-family homes. 
Our two owners of apartments that have a tenants who are low income. As a lender, we make a loan to the to the borrower. The borrower in turn picks a contractor, and the owner enters into a contract with that contractor. The city encourages as many contractors as possible to be on a list. As an example, we have a list right now of around 200 contractors. We're always looking for more. We have orientations where we uh, explain the program. As an example, our most recent orientation was uh, April. 10th of last month. Uh, based upon the interest of a contractor, we will do a background check to make sure that the license is valid with the California Board of the Licensure. We want to make sure they have the proper business license and the proper insurance. And then we suggest to the borrower, here's a list. Some of our contractors only want to work in certain geographic areas, which is fine. So in our five field offices and our four contract agencies, we provide a list of contractors who want to work that particular geographic neighborhood. And we assure the borrower that we did our best to do a background check on that contractor. But at that point, it's up to the owner and contractor to enter into a contract. Where would you get information from, by the general public to find out where the five locations and what is the process to become qualified? That's the main information. Well, number one, we're on the website. Uh, and we do a lot of outreach meetings. Uh, Last, we, we work with council offices who have neighborhood fairs. Uh, and upon the request, we have staff who attend the meetings, uh, solicit uh, uh, borrowers through brochures and fact sheets, so on and so forth. Do we have access to material that we can have in hand. As many of my constituents are not on the website and find it difficult to locate them. Well, we work with different council offices. We, we uh, will provide copies of the brochures for your field offices. Uh, as an example, in about two weeks, we're going to brief your office on what we've done in your council district for the last four or five years. And in there, you'll have Estricto, much information, resource guides, phone directories, all those kinds of things. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Mr. Holden. Mr. President, members, this is, could be a good program, and it could end up in some cases being a fraudulent program imposed on senior citizens who are not familiar with the forms and facts and the law. It states right here that you have a list of contractors. You also have a contract monitor. Yes. Un investigador. Right. And uh, when there's a dispute, uh, the contract monitor is left out of dispute and, and, and is left between the contractor and the, the client to resolve the matter. You seem to me to be clear according to your own report here. No, I think we, we go on to explain, no. Council, that that's the first option is for the two parties to sit down to resolve as, as, that's as, the first as possible. Option. And then the second option, we will come in with our staff person who will work with both the, uh, the owner and the contractor. Yeah, but the final, the, the final option for the <coughs> plaintiff is that uh, you, if you can't get a resolution of the problem, which you've involved the plaintiff in, then you su your, your suggestion is that they go to the state's contracting license board. I mean, it's crazy. The fact of the matter is that these contractors should not receive payment in full. In some cases, they are. They should not. They should, if you have a contract monitor, then the, the contract monitor mm -hmm. should be monitoring the progress of the work that's being done, protecting the homeowner, for the most part, as a senior citizen. Yeah, we do agree with the councilman. And the payments for the work done is on a progressive basis. If, and it starts first with the contractor submitting the bill to the owner. And if the owner does not agree with the work, that owner will not have to pay that contractor. We work with that contractor and that owner to resolve those kinds of disputes. Um, we find that our, we do about 200 loans per year, and we probably average around 8 or 10 where we have these kinds of problems. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, I've known people who have lost their homes but in big legal disputes. Right just because of this kind of a merger. Not through our program, sir. No, no, no. I know a lady who had a, years ago, was in the program. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the contractor then put a lien on her property. Sure. Okay. She subsequently was not aware of all of the, the complexities associated with, with that activity and lost her home. Yes. And there was no contractor, the contractor money was nowhere to be found. Yeah. I mean, it's a good program. Right. But there's collusion. You know, it takes place sometime. Now, you know, everybody can't be all together honest. And what I'm saying to you, I'm not going to indict anybody on the council floor, yeah. but I'm saying to you, there's some fox 
in the chicken coop. Lobos. Hay lobos. And if Hay that's the case, then their gallinero. problems si obviously are going to generate from that arrangement. Sure. Este and it happens a lot and too often. Muy veces. You know, I would suggest to you, for Mr. Parks, Parks, Parks and others, why don't you give us a list of the, how many arrangements you have right now going on and what's the status of them? We report back to the council. Sure. In fact, we're preparing a report. We report to the council whether or not there's any dispute, sure. if there's any problem, identify what the problem's areas are and who's engaged in the problem. Sure. Councilman, uh, in responding to Councilman Wendy Grewell's motion to report on the NPP, which is the primary program, we could add that provision to the report. Right, when will you be reporting back? Uh, it's going back in about a couple of weeks. Oh, that'd be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Gracias, Holden. Mr. Reyes. I just want to thank my colleagues for bringing this to light. I know the Housing Department is working hard to do its job, but I also know that somehow we have to put some kind of a you will have a monitor, right, mm -hmm. in this program? Yes. Um, but there should be like spot checks on how the um, folks who are taking these loans, what's happening in their case. Uh, many times the folks don't speak English. Uh, they trust an authority figure. They see the city of LA, the car, and they say, I'm going to be treated right. Correct. And I'm speaking from experience. And, uh, I literally saw a case where an individual was close to losing their home, their home was the roof, all the work that the contractor did was out of code, it was a complete breakdown. And I started looking at what projects were happening in that area, and it wasn't the only case. Now, this was four or five years ago, but when you started speaking and Mr. Holden and, and, uh, and Mr. Park started raising these questions, I mean, I can't believe that it's still as prevalent as it seems to sound. I mean, is it that prevalent? As, as I said, we're averaging around eight or ten cases a year where we have this complaint. Eight or ten out of how many? About 200 a year. 200? Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would just hope that we could be a little bit more creative in how we do the spot check and yeah. try to control it and find who these contractors are that aren't really meeting ah, the standards that I think you said, because I think you're doing a, uh, the kind of job where you want to have quality, quality control. And it, we are civil servants. We're supposed to be serving these folks. And uh, it's unfortunate there's that kind of abuse. And it always seems to happen to the most vulnerable people. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. Uh, seeing no other colleagues wishing to be heard, Madam Clerk, if you can please open the roll on the item. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 eyes. That item is approved. Thank you. Next item, please. No, item number 18, called special by Councilmember Parks. Councilmember Parks. Uh, item number 18. Can we have staff come up on uh, the transportation issues? <coughs> Valerie Pryor from the Department of Transportation. Yeah. I would just like you to kind of walk me through this primarily because I'm not familiar with the uh, process that we use for this trust fund and how it gets funded and primarily how the uh, projects from different districts get involved or get approved. And so I just need you to walk me through that. Okay. The Transportation Grant Fund is a revolving fund for various transportation projects. The significant bulk are from the MTA call for projects. Each project gets an account within that fund. The fund receives the city front and matching funds and also the MTA grant funds. Each project account then when funded, many of the expenditures can be made from the transportation grant funds, such as for construction contracts, and then a small part of that needs to be transferred to city departments for staff, salaries, and overtime and related costs. That's the bulk of what you see in this report. So, in each transportation grant fund, you'll see the city transfer its front and matching funds generally from Proposition C and receive MTA grant funds for that fiscal year. Those funds will join any funds already in the account or the funds in previous fiscal years. In general, the MTA call for projects is every other year. We are working with all city departments, mayor's office, and council offices right now in the 2003 call for projects applications. 
2003. Cuando las fechas de aprobadas hay reprogramación, si se decide si el costo es menos de No, el MTA no nos permite reprogramar estos fondos. Entonces, cuando pusimos en este lugar cada año, dos años procedemos y lo que no entendí después es que si acerca de una cuenta, ¿dónde se recibe dinero rutinamente? ¿O se recibe dinero rutinamente? Per project is a set amount. For example, if we had an award for a million dollar project, the city would provide 200,000 and the grant would be for 800,000. So the total amount is set. But because the MTA provides the funds on a fiscal year basis as of the city, it revolves in the sense that for a four year project, we would only be putting each fiscal year's funds into the fund that fiscal year. So in that sense, it's a revolving fund. Okay. When, when it's stated in this report, this accounts for $66 million in funds. That's over a longer period than this fiscal year. Correct. The total cost of the projects runs over many fiscal years. So that fund would include projects that were funded and completed and projects that are still in process? Correct. Projects that have been totally completed, the money would be gone, but we still have projects from 93, 95, 97, 99, and the 2001 calls. And then there are a few uh, projects in the 2001 through 2007 call, which are for later years, which have not been funded yet. When we look at this figure, these are all in, uh, com uh, projects that are not completed. If they were completed, they would not be in this report. Correct. Okay. So when we look at the 66 million, it may be over a five or six year period. But they're chugging along through the system. Yes. Now, also on some of these projects, would you assume that this is the total funding, or would they, in next year's uh, call for projects, we continue to fund some that are listed in this proposal? Yes. Uh, next year, we have the money that was programmed for next fiscal year. When we make the application to the MTA and then the MTA awards a grant, each project actually has a cash flow stating in which fiscal years the funds would be provided. We budget our funds that way, and in general, we transfer them in this report according to those cash flows. And every project here has matching funds from the city? Yes. Okay. Now, do we make a decision on what matching funds go, or do we wait until the MTA has decided on what they're going to agree, agree on on the grant? In general, in the past, the MTA, the rules were either for a 20 or a 35 percent match. I believe in the 2003 call, the MTA is only asking for a 20 percent match, but the match amount is determined by the MTA. Okay. And then when is the next call for projects? We are working on the 2003 call for projects right now with the MTA. And, and what do they do to the MTA? We have provided our grant applications to the MTA. The MTA is not issuing decisions yet because they are waiting for the state budget decisions. Some of the money the MTA would program in the call would be local MTA funds and some would be state and federal funds. They so don't know the future of those funds. So, so the, each council office is now submitting to you the proposals? Right. We've already received them and prioritized them and sent them to the MTA. But it is a citywide process. We work with all city departments and all city council offices. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Parks. Uh, Mr. Holden. Mr. Holden. These are call for projects. Let's go to page four, number 16, for street, for the Bureau of Street Services work program. Have you identified where that work's going to be done? I mean, that's just one of them. And then let's go start out with uh, the Advanced Transit Management System program. Uh, where's that work going to be done? And the, that's eight, and then 10, ATSAC program and bikeways program. I mean, where's the bikeway? I mean, did we put specific bikeways in the call for project? Or can you put those bikeways at where they're needed? Or they're, would like to be utilized? They are the bikeways that were approved by the MTA. And uh, you know which ones they are? You're in an atta attachment someplace? Yes, they are in the attachments. For each one of the recommendations that transfers funds to departments, it references a table. For example, for recommendation 16, the Bureau of Street Services, it would be table number eight. All right, before you go to the table, let me just say this then. My question is, why the Department of Transportation submits the request to MTA 
in the call for project program, what they would like to do, where they would like to have an ASAC program to move, keep traffic moving, right? That's number one. Number two, they'd like to know where the bikeway program, what, what bikeways they're going to bring in during that period of time. Uh, it doesn't appear that those bikeways are being given consideration in, in, Mr. in the city in certain areas that Mr. Parks is discussing, or the ASAC program to keep track moving, traffic moving, where the automated traffic signal control, you know, well, the citywide task force that develops the list of projects looks at the MTA's criteria for evaluation, and all city agencies that participate vote on the list of prioritized projects. And in general, we try to match the MTA's requirements for funding. We don't always receive funding in the order that we request the projects, but in the order that the MTA provides at that funding. At one point in time, the Department of Transportation would come to various CASA persons and ask them what they would like to recommend to be considered as a call for project in their respective areas and where the need was. In fact, you would suggest to them where there was a need, like an ASAC, the ASAC or backway or some other transportation need. They have been doing that lately. I believe we have a more formalized process where we actually have a task force and all council offices, all departments are invited to participate in that task force. Which we were not aware of in my office. And I've been around a long time. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, we go back to the old way of doing it, where you just ask each council person to submit a list of priorities, at least for their district, where there's a transportation need that should be met, especially if traffic is being bogged down or you need left turn signals or you need traffic signals in certain places to keep the traffic flowing. And that would be monies coming from MTA and uses the Didn't match with our Prop C money those? where we wouldn't have to use our own money for I traffic signals or left turn signals or, or, or road widening or divided. See what I'm saying? I would think that that's something you should offer us in the future as you have in the past. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Uh, Mr. Parks? Parks. What is the name of the task force that you've been to that's reviewing this citywide? I think it might be the Interdepartmental Task Force on the Call for Projects. Not a very descriptive name. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, we now this item before us. Madam Clerk, could please open the roll. Close the roll and time the vote. That item is approved. I'd like to request that this go forth with, please. We'll do, we'll do, that. Forthwith. We'll do that forthwith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item, please, Madam Clerk. Item number 21, call special by Council Member Holden. Item number 21, uh, Council Member Holden. Mr. Holden, item number 21 is before us. Ms. Miskowski. Oh. Oh. Go ahead, Ms. Miskowski. That's fine. Uh, I spoke to the senator yesterday, but you go ahead. I think, I think what I'd like to do, this has been recommended to oppose uh, until we, we talked for the last couple of weeks about the state senator, and she had been willing to um, go along with the city's request to increase the board membership on this new um, exposition light rail line authority. And I would like to see that we just uh, put a, the council in support of this bill based on the, well, with the amendment, subject to the amendment, that it will be increased to the city council membership. The city membership doesn't necessarily need to be city council. But city representative, representative membership that is uh, consistent with the majority of the land that, uh, through which this line goes, which is in the city of Los Angeles. So that would be my motion. Okay, got a second from Mr. Weiss. Mr. Holden. Second from the audience. <laughs> well, uh, support what? That's the question. The bill is it presently passed the policy committee yesterday. Uh, was something that we cannot support and should not support. Are you aware of that? Podemos apoyar, ¿sabe usted eso? To amendment that it increases the membership of the city of Los Angeles representation. And which we're not being specific. I understand the point you're making. If it in increases the member representation uh, to three, and if it's not three, then what? It's subject to that amendment. Then what, would, what should be the position of the city council? I think we might have a different opinion. I support the bill, absolutely. But I think the city's position should be to support the bill only if amended to include up to three, uh, include three specific L.A. member represent representatives. Well, I agree with that. 
Now, let me just point out a couple of facts. Uh, fact number one, the, dish, the exposition right away is about 85, 90 percent the city of Los Angeles. And exposition right away of that portion, maybe 60 plus percent is located in the 8th, 9th, and 10th district. And the people in that area are going to need some representation to have some assurance that if there's a line going through that is subsequently built, it will not be a great level to serve their living environment. And we can't ramrod something through and then later on after the fact say, oh, we got a problem. Uh, make it a great level like the blue line and get everybody killed trying to cross it. So we have to have some understanding coming with a comprehensive program with the community being involved in the process. And I would say that to, to take less than three representatives is not a good idea at all. I spoke to the senator yesterday, and she said she would like to have our support, but what she did say is that now that we are asking for three representatives, the county is not asking for an additional rep. They have two. We had one. They're asking for three representatives as well. Uh, and this could go on. She's in the process of trying to negotiate with the county, and she would like to have the support of the city of Los Angeles. I think you're aware of this, sir. Is that correct? Uh, but I think that we should be in opposition to this measure unless and until, and I would re relate this message to the Senate again, unless and until we have three members represented on this board by the city of Los Angeles with the point of authority. Uh, otherwise, we have no voice. If you have no voice, then the construction can get out of control. Yes, I'm sorry. Can, can I just add, Mr. Holder, are you willing to say we oppose it until these are added, but when they're added, we would support it? Absolutely. I like that. Then I, then I have no problem with that. Right. Then I take the motion as amended. Is is right compatible with my motion that I originally introduced. He amended my motion on, on this item, then that'll be fine. I'll accept a friendly amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Holden and Ms. Miskowski. We have that friendly amendment uh, to the motion. Um, now have that before us, if you can please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 That is approved. That will be part of our legislative program. Next item, please. Uh, next item, Mr. President, item number 25, call special by Council Member Holden. Mr. Holden. This is going to be so short when I leave. You've got that right. All right, we got some FEMA money coming over here. And uh, I think you just like to know about that. Make it short because they want to get out of here. They don't care how important it is, they just want to leave. <laughs> The fire department will get some FEMA money for equipment. Weapons of mass destruction, is that what it is? Yes, sir. It's uh, no, grant money for it. Grant money for weapons of mass destruction in the city of Los Angeles. So the federal government is providing funding for that purpose. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Tell us about it. Uh, well, we've been participating here in the city of Los Angeles for 10 years on uh, FEMA's Urban Search and Rescue Program. And two years ago, they uh, expanded the program to include weapons of mass destruction which uh, enhances our capability, increases the, the team from 62 to 70, and gives us more equipment. And subsequent to uh, September 11th, they've significantly increased our funding. And for this year's grant, they've uh, allotted $740,000 to all 28 teams in the United States. So that's what we're eligible for. Is 740 right now for uh, continued uh, enhancements to our program. They've, they've earmarked basically $250,000 for administrative support, $200,000 for training, $180,000 for additional equipment purchases, uh, $10,000 for operation readiness and evaluation, and $100,000 for planning, engineering, and minor renovation costs. Yes. Each of the teams gets $740,000 for that, each of the 28. Our portion is $740,000. Will you not be called to work with the home security program that much closer? Uh, not really. Uh, FEMA is uh, 
uh, administrates this program and we deal directly with them. They tell us what equipment we should have, what, what the training criteria is, and they even recommend how this money should be used for administrative support, and that's how we arrived at uh, asking for two captain ones and a management analyst just to manage the documentation and administrative support for this program. Very good. But they're not working with at all with the home security program. Well, <coughs> FEMA is under or a part of Homeland Security. I'm not sure what happens well, in that case, on long they, they're working, they, they, you know, they're not spending money over here and money over there and, and the program is not merged. As long as the program no. is somewhere, it's, yeah, it's, separate. it's considered to be merged. All right. Yes. That's fine. Finding the weapons, let me know. Well, I'm glad you brought this special. You know, because it's, it's, uh, it, it is an interest. I'm, um, in my opinion, there's only uh, one major area in the city that uh, we could actually have weapons of mass destruction. That's certainly through our port and our harbor. How is uh, this money going to be um, used to uh, be prepared uh, for weapons of mass destruction that may come into our harbor? In title, the, the term weapons of mass destruction for the FEMA team just means that we are capable of, of operating within a, a WMD environment. But keep in mind that this is a FEMA urban search and rescue task force. So in the event that there was an incident, heaven forbid, in the harbor or anywhere in the city for that matter, uh, where we would need to deploy a WMD, FEMA, Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, we could operate within that environment. And that, that, that's the meaning of it, of us being a WMD task force. We started out first walking as a, as a Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, meaning we have technical search and rescue equipment. Uh, we have a, an organized group of, of city employees that can respond anywhere in the country. Uh, and since then, it has evolved into a WMD capability, which just means that in the event that there is a dirty bomb associated with it that we have the protection and the additional staffing to operate. So that's the enhancement to the city's team as it exists right now. The enhanced staffing, is that mainly? Um, it's hazmat. I can tell you real hazmat. easy. Yeah. Okay. The team was 62 people and FEMA increased it to 70 and those additional, we already had two hazmat techs on the team originally. And they and where are they, it by where are they located? The, these members are employed just like I am employed on a daily basis everywhere. And, and for an example, on September 11th, when we were called into action, uh, we have a call-out process where we bring in doctors from from the local community, uh, firefighters, police, uh, our animal control, or our, our uh, canine handlers are from uh, police and fire. We call them in at our point of departure. We call it right there at Fire Station 88 in the San Fernando Valley, and off we go. So it's we all have other jobs. There, there it's not full time hazmat. No, no. Uh, at, just inherently, though, the people that are our hazmat people on the on the FEMA task force are working hazmat task forces in the city of Los Angeles anyway. So they work at 70s or 48s or, or so fire station there, four. So they're down there at 48. Yeah. And this money is over the last 10 years, FEMA has continued to give us money in support of the program. Uh, that's that's their cut of the deal. When when the city council and the mayor approved this program, us participating in this program 10 years ago, uh, we were obligated to FEMA to put together the team and, and train and whatnot. And their cut was to provide us funding. And over the years, it's whatever they get out of their budget is how they divide it up. And it just so happens that this year, at 740. Thank you. Thank you for calling that special, Mr. Councilman Holden. Mr. LaBonge. Oh, thank you. Hi, Chief. I, did anyone go up to Seattle or back to Chicago with this federal drill that's going on? No. No. Okay. I understand, though, that we're uh, gearing up for one of our own. Okay, good. All right. I just wanted to know that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. Are the members wishing to be heard? Seeing none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. On item 25, please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. 
That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 34, call special by Council Member Pacheco, and there is an amending Pacheco, motion that has been distributed. Okay. Mr. Pacheco. In the room. Let's give Mr. Pacheco a minute to re enter Council Chambers. Uh, there is a matter still on the desk, Mr. President. Item number um, 12E that Council Member uh, Perry had reconsidered from Friday's meeting. Yes, Ms. Perry. Right, I needed to clarify that. Thank you for being patient. That was an item from the 9th of May. It was, it was item 12E, and I want to ask my colleagues to adopt a substitute motion, and that is to waive fees for an Xbox briefing at the Grand Olympic Auditorium. The auditorium is a city-sponsored venue, so any event there with public benefit, uh, the city will assume the cost for for that the event, much like Staples or the uh, Dodger Stadium. Okay. And Madam Clerk, we have clarification on the item number. Uh, yes, it was 12E from Friday. Okay. Uh, members, we have previously reconsidered this item. Ms. Perry offers a substitute motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Mr. Reyes? Council President, if I can do forthwith on items 19 and 39. Forthwith on 19 and 39. This is Mr. Pacheco back with us. Okay, 30 seconds and counting on Mr. Pacheco. Are there any announcements in the meantime? There are two special motions, Mr. President. Let's take the special items next. Uh, uh, there are two specials. First one is presented by Councilmember Mustakowski, seconded by Councilmember Grohl, and the City Attorney will speak to the findings. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll read into the record the findings for Council to consider. Since the posting of today's agenda, City officials have been made aware of new information that supports an increase of grant funding and an additional tenancy pursuant to the Displaced Tenant Relocation Grants previously approved by Council following a fire March 17, 2003, at 8 East Brooks Avenue. Immediate action is required to assist these tenants who otherwise apparently would be without shelter. Pursuant to the government code, council must first determine whether there is a need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of council after the posting of today's agenda. If such a finding is made, the department requests that the council authorize the disbursement of such funds. Members wish to be heard on the findings. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the wall on the findings. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Special one is now before us. Members wishing to be heard of the motion itself. Ms. Mitsikowski. Members, as we know, when we've had uh, families uh, who are in need all of a sudden subjected to a calamity, the loss of their apartments through fire, explosion, etc., we have set a process up, and actually it's now going to be regularized in the housing department, that up to $50,000 they will be able to provide assistance to tenants um, based on a Qualification, they have to be in need, and they will either be receive a grant of about $2,000 or $5,000. We had done that in this case, up to $50,000, but there's now, it's been learned in this particular building that there are um, two tenants who were able to su supply information and now qualify, and one uh, tenant uh, supplied additional information and was able to qualify for a higher amount. That will increase the total amount of grant um, by a modest amount, $8,000, and I think that's $4,000 more than the $50,000 threshold. So we need approval of the council to allow this to be received by these tenants who do qualify and are in the same situation as the others. And it is part of our process that says when there's a request beyond the $50,000 overall per incident, that it does need to come for council for approval. So the city attorney has verified this, housing department has verified these numbers, and I ask for an high vote. Other members wishing to be heard on this item. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on special one. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Fourth with, please. Next item. And there is a special two that was presented by Council Member Labange and seconded by Council Member Weiss. The City Attorney will speak to the findings. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll read the, into the record the findings for Council to consider. Since the posting of today's agenda, the Los Angeles Police Department has requested 
that the city offer a reward for information leading to the conviction of the suspect or suspects who committed the triple homicide in the Miracle Mile area last week. Immediate action is required to attempt to expeditiously solve this crime. Pursuant to the government code, council must first determine whether there is a need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of council after the posting of today's agenda. If such a finding is made, council may consider the substantive motion. Members wishing to be heard on the findings? Mr. Labonge, is this on the findings? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the findings. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Special two now before us. Members wishing to be heard, Mr. Labonge. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, this was again another tragedy, unfortunately, in our city. But uh, two family members and another party were in a home at 6.30 a week ago, Monday night. Uh, robbery homicide division is working diligently on this case and uh, ask that this motion and request of our office be put forward for this reward of this family, including a very young child who was viciously murdered murdered that evening. Uh, Wilshire area is having community uh, meetings uh, with the area residents uh, on issues related to this. I ask for your eye vote and appreciate your support on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Labange. Are there members wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on special two. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Forthwith, please. Next item. Item number 34 is still on the desk. Okay, Ms. Misikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, on Mr. Pacheco's behalf, this is a routine transfer of money from um, certain GCP funds or um, neighborhood trust fund monies to uh, specific community groups in Council District 14, out of Council 14 District. Uh, Accounts. Well, look who's come here. Um, Mr. Pacheco had introduced a motion to just amend this from a technical point, taking it from one area to another within the Council of District 14 portion of the salary account. And I was going to move 34A, and Mr. Pacheco has joined us. Thank you for moving it. Well, second Pacheco. Anything further, Mr. Pacheco? No. After making us late. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. On item 34, please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That matter is amended as approved. Next item. This is the time for comments from the public on items not on Council's agenda. And seeing no request from members of the public to address the Council on non-agenda items, public comment for today is closed. Next item, please. Council has motions for posting and referral. Motion shall be posted and referred. There are excuses on the desk. Council Member Reyes requests to be excused Wednesday, May 14th to leave at noon for city business. That meets Council policy. Mr. Reyes is excused. Council Member Misikowski requests to be excused Tuesday, June 3rd to arrive at 11.30 for city business. That also meets council policy. Ms. Misikowski is excused. And uh, that clears the desk, Mr. President. Okay. Members, are there any yeah. announcements? Any announcements today? Mr. Labange? No announcements no, today? No, no, no. Do we have adjourning motions? Yep. Please rise for adjourning motions. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. I ask that we adjourn today in the memory of William Olson, a San Pedro legend who passed away last week at the age of 99. He was born in 1904 in Oakland, and his father was a sea captain and moved the family uh, to San Pedro in 1919. Bill's career following school was as a shipwright, designing and building boats, including building, building wooden boats for the Navy during World War II. Bill married Evelyn Peterson in 1960, only to lose her uh, three years later through death. Throughout his career, he was frequently sought out by historians and authors seeking an expert about San Pedro and the maritime industry. He was an, an articulate speaker and prolific writer and poet. He also wrote columns for the old San Pedro News Pilot for many years. 
Bill was emeritus historian of the Los Angeles Maritime Museum, which he helped establish 25 years ago. Despite his age, he still remained active and served as assistant curator for the museum, providing tours to visitors until his hospitalization last week. Dr. Pete Lee, our director of the Maritime Museum and longtime friend, described Bill as the happiest kid in San Pedro. He had a wonderful disposition and his memory was incredible. He was a charter member of the San Pedro Bay Historical Society and its president, Art Almeida, described Bill perfectly. He loved he loved history and he loved San Pedro. Uh, with the passing of Bill Olson, San Pedro has truly lost one of its greatest legends. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it came as a great shock to many in the Echo Park community and probably many around this horseshoe to learn that uh, Sue Nelson, um, an activist and advocate who was just in chambers quite recently, um, died on May 3rd, reportedly from injuries from uh, being hit by a car on Sunset Boulevard in Echo Park. Um, she was somebody who um, was truly a fighter. Um, I think sometimes we are, we'd all find ourselves on the same side sometimes, we'd find ourselves on opposite sides, but somebody who fought hard in Elysian Park to prevent a convention center from being built there many years ago, was head of the Angeles chapter of the Sierra Club, and had been active in the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and the Green Party. Um, she was somebody who was tenacious, uh, somebody who would show up at, at community meetings and would often represent the community um, many times when the community didn't have a voice, um, taking unpopular stands, um, and other times um, taking leadership that really led uh, the community forward. It's most tragic that she uh, ended her life this way and apparently for some time was unidentified um, at the morgue and nobody knew that it had happened when Word spread this weekend in Echo Park that she had passed away. Again, people who loved her, some who hated her, I think all realized that they all mourned her and that her passing really uh, was the end of a generation of activism in Echo Park and in Los Angeles. May she rest in peace. I just want to add, uh, during our charter reform, uh, those two years, Sue Nelson was a regular uh, at many of our late, late night meetings, um, again, fighting uh, for specific reforms to be uh, placed in our, our city charter and uh, was, uh, really was an advocate for so, for so many uh, of those in Los Angeles who uh, never had a voice. So uh, we will greatly miss her uh, activism. Council President, I may yeah, like to uh, also echo uh, the thoughts of my colleagues. Um, when I first met Sue, we were fighting for Kite Hill and Echo Park back when that was in my district in the early 90s. Her passion for open space was incredible. Her knowledge for planning, uh, her understanding of the principles of development, and her uh, healthy cynicism as to how deals are made uh, were ones in which informed many people who were not tuned into those types of dynamics. And uh, I salute her for all her advocacy. I always felt her heart was in the right place. Maybe the delivery wasn't so smooth, but the truth of it, she meant well and she worked hard. Ms. Misikowski. Let me add uh, to that, I think Sue's beginnings were in the Brentwood community, because that's where she and her husbands first settled and had their children. In the early 60s, she was very active in something called the University, University Elementary School, which was the pro progressive school that UCLA set up, where they actually had school children going there at UCLA to the elementary school, because it was their way of teaching teachers. And uh, Sue Nelson's children went there, and Marvin Browdy's children went there. And it's where they met in the early 60s and developed and understood each other in their passion for this wonderful open space that was behind that community in the Santa Monica Mountains. And in 1964, Sue Nelson and Marvin Browdy were the original founders of something called Friends of the Santa Monica Mountain Park, which was the idea behind creating a great park that today we are all reaping the benefits of. Uh, Sue's passion there was unbelievable, led to then her encouraging Marvin to run for office against a then incumbent who he defeated in 1965, Carl Rundberg, and, and their lives were entwined 
thereafter, as everyone has indicated, not always in supporting each other, but in the passion for what she believed in. And I think in, in part of what Mr. Reyes was talking about, about her incredible indomitable spirit and knowledge, um, Sue was actually asked to teach at SIARC, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, in its early days to teach young students who were then looking at what and how they should contribute to an urban landscape and an urban space uh, and open space way back in the 70s and early 80s when this wasn't even a concept. She was there instructing and teaching young students who wanted to make their life in building this city and building this city with cognizance of open space and buildings and green ideas. And she was a professor there for many, many years, so that we have a lot of future generations who have learned from her and are going on and building and contributing today. She truly is and has been an indomitable spirit. I mean, remembering her here in days when the council was filled, fighting things like receded to the sea. Um, they were things that she stood for passionately uh, and always will. And I think it was fascinating that she then moved from the west side to Echo Park and continued that passion and those same principles and brought the sense of open space and green space and commitment to that portion of where she lived, uh, uniting it all together. So she really will be an amazing spirit that is lost now to the city. And the tributes, Mr. I just Bunch. wanted to say for Sue Nelson a wonderful tribute to each of those who spoke, talked about somebody, and that's really what makes a city. When you were talking, Janice, about the fighters of, uh, of people coming to the Charter Reform and uh, know how people like Sue Nelson, but really she's right up there, who were so tenacious on keeping parks parks and the importance of that aspect uh, of our open space and our land, and that's so tragic to hear of this. Eric and uh, an unfortunate uh, mishap on Sunset Boulevard, but uh, and it is nice too how people transform and, and go across the city. And I and I look and there's just but a few in the council chambers now, but we see the faces of which Sue was just here, as Eric mentioned, like two weeks ago. Uh, but the faces of people who've come here—that's truly what makes the city. It's unfortunate that she. Uh, lost her life in an, an accident, but she did contribute. I met her years and years ago on the first, well, it wasn't the first master plan, but the 1976, 77 master plan for Griffith Park, which we just started to do again here 25 years later. She was always, wherever it was in the city, if it had to do with a park, an open space, Sue Nelson was there. Other tributes? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned. And before adjourning, I just want to tell you all, you all know that the Ad Hoc Committee on the Budget is not uh, meeting today at 2, especially for those who watch us through Channel 35 or on the radio or telephone. We're not meeting today, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pacheco. This meeting is adjourned.